Hey guys, here's the first part of November's compilations. I'd like to give a quick shout out to my patrons and thank them for supporting the channel. So huge thanks to Fyro5, Linda, Shan, Jody, Sarah P, James Gargano, Gemma Allen, Monica Levelace, Alex, Courtney Maxwell, Kathleen Fenton, Jill Hutchins, and Elena Renee. Enjoy the video, guys. This happened a few years ago, but still freaks me out when I think about how differently it could have turned out. My husband, baby, and I used to live in the not greatest apartment complex. There were three sections of this complex with a total of six apartments, three on top, three on the bottom, and two different buildings within each section. I lived in the upper middle apartment of the second building, in the second section. I got along with my neighbors fine. We actually all moved into our apartments within a few weeks of each other. To my left is a woman we'll call Barb, in her fifties and lives alone. Barb is a drinker, and a big participant of any substances that make her feel good. She has a rotation of man friends that come and go, all fine by me. She gives me no issues, so I don't really care what she does. I already mentioned that these weren't the best apartments. They were income-based, old and cheap. I'm pretty sure the walls were insulated with newspaper, if they had any insulation at all. So you could hear basically everything from both surrounding apartments and a lot of the units below. The only time it really became an issue is during nap time and night time, when someone would either prevent my one-year-old from sleeping or wake him. It didn't happen often, and when it did, I was always able to go knock on the culprit's door and handle it with no issues. Since my child was still a baby, and I was constantly exhausted, 90% of his bedtime was my bedtime. Our bedrooms were on the opposite side of the apartment from the living room and kitchen, and Barb's apartment. We also slept with both a noise machine and a fan to drown out any noise disturbances during the night. This particular night though, my husband was off of work, and we decided to watch a movie. There was a party going on in the first building of our section. Barb was friends with the party throwers, and we could hear her in and out of her apartment door several times as well as all the party people who were outside smoking. At some point during the movie, I fell asleep using my husband's lap as a pillow. Around 2am, loud laughing from Barb's apartment wakes me up. I get up to pee and brush my teeth, before coming back to kiss my husband a good night and get into bed. I do my business and make my way back to the living room from the bathroom to tell my husband good night. I then hear knocking on Barb's door, followed what sounds like her door exploding off its hinges and flying into the wall that separates her apartment and ours. My husband and I both say what the hell at the same time and just kind of freeze. We hear Barb and a man talking. It sounded like normal talking, they weren't yelling or anything. So we chalk it up to Barb and her guests having a little too much fun at the party and shrug it off. I get into bed and quickly fall asleep. No more than 10 minutes after getting into bed, I wake up to what sounds like heavy furniture being body slammed coming from Barb's apartment. Irked from the second slumber disturbance, and knowing this is going to wake up my kid, I make my way back to the living room, planning on putting my slippers on and knocking on Barb's door to kindly ask her to shut up. I first walk out onto my balcony to smoke a cigarette, all whilst hoping she realizes how loud she is and to fix it without being asked. The body slumming furniture only gets even louder while on the balcony, so I assume they've worked their way through her apartment and are body slamming her bedroom furniture now. Even more irritated now, I decide Barb's too blitz to realize how loud she's being and I'm going to have to remind her that none of us are deaf in my apartment or she was going to have to stop what she was doing, or reschedule it for appropriate hours. I stand up and take a few steps towards Barb's window, 
where our small bucket for cigarette butts sits on the ledge of my balcony. Her bedroom window and the closest edge of my balcony to her window are only inches apart, so she could easily crawl out of her window and onto my balcony or vice versa. And that's when I hear it. Muffled screams like someone is holding a hand over a mouth, and a man's voice saying a very low voice, If you don't shut up, I'm going to kill you. Oh shit, is my first thought. I fly inside the sliding door from my balcony and grab my phone to call 911 while telling my husband Barb is in trouble. He goes out and bangs on the door. Nobody comes. It's locked because he tried the door handle after not being answered. I'm standing between the living room and the kitchen on the phone with 911. My husband walks outside and leans over to see if he can see anything through Bob's windows. The blinds are closed, but a couple of blind slats are broken, leaving a small crack big enough for my husband to see that someone is laying on the floor, halfway in her bedroom and halfway into her bathroom, and another person standing over them. He tells me, and I relay it to the 911 operator, while also adding if the police aren't here soon, we were going to bust the door down ourselves. She calmly asks me not to do anything like that, to stay on the line, and that police were en route, and would arrive soon. About two minutes later, we hear several pairs of boots coming up the apartment stairs. To get to the second level, our apartments are on, and then pounding on Barb's door, followed with, it's the police, open up. I crack my front door to peek out and tell them we can still see the two people in the back bedroom of Barb's apartment. There are four uniformed officers with their guns drawn and the one standing on my front door tells me to go back inside and lock the door. Yes, sir. I go back inside and stand right inside my balcony door to watch for anything, like Barb trying to escape the man or the man trying to escape the cops. We hear another round of police pounding at Barb's door with no answer, and then the sound of the door being kicked in. Fire and rescue have shown up by this point, and the whole apartment complex is lit up with lights coming from the emergency vehicles. We hear a small scuffle, and then the screen door of her apartment creak open. I look out of the peephole and see a man in handcuffs being led down the stairs, and then EMT coming up the stairs with a stretcher. A few minutes later, we hear the screen door crack open again, and I see an EMT carrying a stretcher with someone in it. I open my door. Barb is unconscious and in a bad shape. Her face and head are bloody and swelling. The exposed skin of her arms are already bruising. As I'm staring at her and the stretcher going down the stairs in disbelief, the same police officer that told me to get back inside and lock my doors walks out of Barb's apartment and asks if he can speak to my husband and me. I say yes and we invite him inside. He then thanks us for calling 911. He says that he has little doubt that we saved Barb's life. He asks us what we heard and I reiterate the whole story from beginning to end as he takes notes. He thanks us again and leaves. Barb calls me about a week later from the hospital to thank me. I ask how she is. She tells me that she has a fractured skull and bleeding on her brain, a broken cheekbone and jaw, broken ribs, and lots of bruising all over her body. But she feels lucky to be alive and thank me again. She also tells me that the man is someone she has known for several years. He showed up to the party right before she went home to her own apartment, and he was mad that she didn't want to sleep with them, and even madder that she had been super flirty with someone else at the party. Several months later, the ADA prosecuting the man calls me and asks me to tell her everything from that night. So I tell her from start to finish, too. She asks if I will be willing to testify in court, and I tell her whatever she needs to lock that animal up. A couple of weeks after that, I come home and have someone's on my door to be a witness in that case. But the court date listed had already passed. I call the ADA back and explain both worried about how me not testifying hurt the case and putting him away, and also if I had a warrant out for my arrest for no showing. She tells me that the date was wrong, but that I'm also not needed. 
I catch up with Barb a few weeks after that, and she tells me that my recorded call to 911 was used during court, and that the guy got 15 years in prison. So this happened to me and a few other guys about two weeks ago. I'm a career firefighter in southwest Florida, and we respond pretty regularly to medical alarm activations. Tonight, we were dispatched along with EMS to a medical alarm activation. Once on scene, we noted a small mobile home with no car and no lights on. So we did our standard knock on the front door, and we clearly hear a woman calling for help. It was clear enough to the point we were able to narrow down the room she was in from the outside. All the doors were locked, so myself and my partner climbed through a window and searched the entirety of the home to find absolutely no one. And the creepiest part of it is afterwards we talked with the EMS guys, who stayed outside and talked with her. They said they were talking with her until they heard us in the same room. Definitely a spine-chilling call. Back in 2015, I was working in a live-in home health aid for a wealthy family. It was just me and my patient living in a very nice condo in a quiet neighborhood on a golf course. We were the youngest people who lived there. I was 27 at the time. My patient was a 21-year-old male with Asperger's, schizophrenic personality disorder, and bipolar disorder, and some substance abuse problems. He had recently gotten into some trouble and been legally declared as incompetent. We will call him Jake. Jake was a nice kid, but he had severe emotional issues and almost no social awareness, compounded by the refusal to take prescribed medication and drug abuse. He was taken advantage of a lot because of the crowd that he hung around with. Right before I moved in, six friends came to hang out with Jake one day and ended up staying for two weeks, draining Jake's bank account on various drugs and absolutely trashing the condo. Jake was lonely and he'd never said no to people. He wanted them to like him. Honestly, I think Jake was 14 to 15 years old mentally. I think he turned to drugs to deal with his depression and anxiety and also fit in with people around him. He's much better now. It was a sweet gig. I was paid very well, lived in a nice condo rent free, and basically just had to keep our house clean, keep food in the fridge, and make sure he took his medication. When I moved in, my boss, Jake's mother, warned me about a girl who occasionally stayed with her father, who was our downstairs neighbor. She told me that the girl was named Amber and that she looked younger but she was 37 years old, tall, blonde, and very thin. She was right. She looked much younger, like 25-ish. She said Amber didn't have a car or a job, and that she was addicted to drugs who liked to use Jake. Amber's father had custody of her two children, and she would come and visit the kids and stay for a few days a week. She said one day Amber asked to borrow Jake's car for an hour, and ended up running off with it for two weeks. Amber was the one who introduced Jake to the six friends who trashed the condo. She was bad news, and was never to be allowed in the condo. She wanted me to call her immediately if Amber stopped by, or if Jake went anywhere with her. My boss made it clear that she didn't expect me to be a security guard, just to notify her of things that were going on. Leading up to this event, I had a few run-ins with this Amber, where I had to politely tell her things like she was not allowed to come into the apartment. Jake could not take her to the store or anywhere. Jake couldn't go to a party at her boyfriend's house, etc. Amber was always spaced out. She talked slow and seemed wide-eyed and off. She explained to me that she had been hit by a car while riding a bike recently and complained that she was the one who ended up going to jail. In my head, I thought, how? 
Apparently she takes a lot of Xanax and was under the influence. So I think that explains the spaced out part. Anyway, she was never aggressive, but it was clear that she didn't like me and would often say things like, Jake is his own person. He's a 21-year-old man. He doesn't need permission. And whenever she spoke to Jake, whenever we saw her at the gym or in a parking lot, she would be whispering to him, no doubt trying to manipulate him into giving her money or something. Anyway, on to the incident. Jake was out of state with his father, giving me a mini vacation. My best friend was staying over to spend a few days with me, and we were drinking PBR and watching RuPaul's Drag Race. It's like 11pm. We hear a light knock on the door. I go to investigate through the peephole, and I see it's Amber. I ignore her. She knocks louder about 30 seconds later. I watch her leave through the peephole and sit back down, and I tell my friend the situation. Five minutes go by, and she's back. This time, she's pounding on the door like a cop. I'm getting pissed because I'm off work, and I don't want to deal with her, especially when my friend is over, so I say nothing and go back to the couch. She knocks like a normal person, and then starts yelling, Hello? Jake? Someone? I need help. Hello? I still don't answer, then I hear her try to open the door. It's locked, and this enrages her or something. She starts screaming and pounding on the door non-stop. I get up and look through the peephole again, and she looks like a demon. Her pupils were huge, so I think she was on something. She looked crazed. Her hair was tangled and wild. She was sweaty and angry. Looking back, I will never forget those white pupils looking at me through an evil glare. I ask her through the door what she wants. She said she needs to speak with Jake right now. He owes her money, and she needs a ride to her boyfriend's house right now. I tell her Jake isn't home. She then asks me if I will take her. I tell her no, I've been drinking and I'm going to bed. She let out the frustrated scream, punched the door, and then left. My friend and I went to bed shortly after. We didn't hear from her again after that. The next morning, we're getting ready to leave to get breakfast. I hear a knock like a policeman's knock at the door. You know the sound. I look through the people, expecting to see Amber, but this time, it's an actual cop. I open my door and can see my parking lot is full of police. There's a van marked crime scene unit and an ambulance. I honestly assumed Amber overdosed or something. The cop wants to ask me if I heard anything strange last night. I tell him about my encounter with Amber and ask if she is okay. He tells me she's in custody for the murder of her father. Does Jake own a crossbow and is it missing? Yes and yes. It's been missing for weeks. He says I need to speak with some detectives at the station. So I don't know if she came to my door before or after she murdered her father with a crossbow, like she's Tyrion Lannister or something. But the detective told me that his theory was that she was abusing heroin and she was withdrawing and needed to get to her boyfriend for some more dope. She tried to get Jake to drive her, and when that didn't work, she asked her father who refused. This is what went down. They argued she killed him with a stolen crossbow and stole his truck. She only got a mile away before she was signaled to pull over. She led the cops in a high-speed chase over the span of two counties, before she finally lost control and crashed. The cops were only pulling her over on suspicion of drink driving, but when they went to speak to her, she told them that she was speeding because she needed to check on her dad. She thinks someone stabbed him. They asked her why she thought that, and she wouldn't answer. They sent police for a welfare check and they found him before her sons did. So that was the time my crazy drug abusing neighbor murdered her father with my patient's crossbow.
This happened to me a few years ago. I live in Arizona, by the way, in the mighty Mojave. I was on my patio, having just finished dragging two full trash cans of weeds and dead branches from my backyard. My dog, my little buddy, was, as usual for him, following me around like my shadow. It was a nice, clear crystal blue day in early May, when it's not too hot and not too cold and I was feeling pretty good. I became aware of a car pulling up in my driveway, and out of the corner of my eye, I saw that it was a big black SUV. At first, I thought it was an aunt of mine, the only person I know with one. I'm a little surprised by the sudden visit, but whatever. I scoot the trash cans on the side of my gate, and then turned away, suddenly stopping. It is at this point, that I see the word Sheriff written on the side in big red letters. Immediately, I start wondering if I'd done something illegal. I was fairly certain that I hadn't, and that's when the thought that something happened to my mom and grandma popped into my head. They were both out at a casino that day, and now I start worrying that there was an accident or maybe a carjacking. Then the deputy gets out. I see on his face a very large grin, and that threw me off. I approach my gate and quiet down my little buddy, who started growling, as he always did whenever someone or something started to come onto the property. He approaches the gate, and I politely greet him. Hello there, officer. How can I help you? I say, trying to keep a cool exterior, while internally... I am frantically trying to think of a reason as to why he would be here. Hello there, sir, he said, still grinning. Do you live here? Yes, sir, I answer. And are you the only person who lives here? He asked me. I am still very nervous and confused, but I answer him. Yes, sir. We got some calls of complaints about someone at this address. He explains. I was thrown through another loop as I had not been expecting that being the reason. I generally keep to myself, and I don't do things like shoot off fireworks or make a lot of noise, so I couldn't imagine what I could have done to warrant someone calling the cops on me to complain. While this had been confusing enough already, I was solely unprepared for what the officer had to say next. Yeah. We got a call from one of your neighbors that someone at this address, matching your description, has been climbing on the roof and firing a microwave gun into their head in order to change their thoughts. I stand there for what felt like a full 30 seconds, letting what he just said sink in. What? I asked after it had sunk in, not comprehending what I had just been told. He was still smiling as he calmly repeated what he had said. I then asked him to repeat himself a third time, to which he complied, and my brain was finally able to accept this new piece of information. Several sets of new neighbors had been moving into the area, and one of them was a very odd man. We'll call him Weirdo. Well, Weirdo had moved into the house at the end of the street with his sister, at first, he had seemed nice, if maybe a little bit too friendly. After creeping me and a bunch of people out with the weird things he would say, he had gone and said some very gross things to my mom, who at the time had been working as a cashier at the general store. She almost tossed him out right then and there. His sister, I felt bad for, because she was constantly going around town, apologizing for the things he would say and do. Anyways... I just knew that Weirdo had been the one to call and complain about me using an imaginary ray gun on him, because that seemed in the ballpark of things he would do. Anyways, the officer told me that he was required to ask me if I had a microwave gun anywhere on the property. At that point in time, part of his job was to ask me if I was in possession of an imaginary ray gun. In a very calm voice, I said, No, sir. I don't even know what a microwave gun would even look like. Neither do I, he said, shaking his head, letting slip a chuckle. But I had to ask, and I have to ask you, 
to please refrain from using one in the future. It was at that point that his composure slipped some more, and he started laughing outright. While part of me did find it very funny as well, a more pragmatic part of me started to worry about Weirdo and his delusions involving me. I know that the vast majority of people with mental illnesses aren't going to harm anybody, but this guy was constantly going on about his knives, and now apparently had some kind of fixation on me, so I found it more unnerving than anything. Once the officer had regained his composure, yet was still smiling, he informed me that he could not tell me who it was that reported it, but that he felt I should be aware of them. I told him I had a pretty good idea of who it was, and pointed down the street towards Weirdo's house. He stopped me and said he was going somewhere else on the street, and that I really should pay attention to where he goes next. I nodded, and after he got back in his vehicle and backed out, I watched and waited for him to go to Weirdo's house. He doesn't. He pulls into the driveway of the house right across the street from mine. I am absolutely dumbfounded, as the man who had moved in, I had never spoken two words to, or even met before. Out of some weird instinct, I dug down and peeked through the lattice next to my gate not wanting to be seen. The officer pulled in and got out of his SUV. He walked right up to the front door and knocked. Instantly, just as he pulled his hand away, the door was wrenched open, and out comes the owner, screaming his head off. I couldn't quite understand what he was screaming, just that it was something along the lines of, You can't be here. I was amazed by the composure of the deputy, he remained calm as this lunatic was screaming right in his face and was trying to calm him down. As soon as the guy calmed down, he cussed at the officer, then stormed back inside and slammed the door behind him. I was afraid that he was going to look in my direction, so I had ducked down behind my fence. The officer drove off, and I heard nothing else about any complaints. Well, the next day, after I told my mom about this, she went and spoke to her friend, who was the real estate agent who sold him the house. This is how she told me the conversation went. You know that house you sold across the street from my son? Yeah. Did you know you sold it to a lunatic? Oh my god, what did he do now? I can't help but feel like either I or my mom should have gotten a phone call or something. Just a casual heads up. Apparently, this guy had a bit of a reputation in the local real estate community, at least from what my mom's friend hinted. I mean, I respect other people's privacy, but come on. Just a, by the way, your new neighbor might be slightly mentally ill, or something. Well, not even a full week later, I'm in my car driving home from the grocery store. I'm nearing my street and I smell some smoke. My thought process was along the lines of, oh, someone's grilling. I think I'll start thawing out and marinating some steaks, and then put them on the grill tomorrow. Well, as I'm driving up my street towards my house, I see the lunatic standing in his front yard, spraying his house with his garden hose. I just write it off as him being odd, but then I see my mom in my driveway, frantically waving. I pull in to see what was happening and look behind me, now seeing the flames. I don't know how my eyes just kind of glazed over the smoke rising from his house, but I could see it now. My mom had seen it and come running, worried that it was my house, and upon seeing that it wasn't, she got worried that the main gas line would ignite and blow up. The fire department shows up, I think maybe 10 minutes later, and then get to work on it. But the house is not salvageable. He did, before they showed up, start running in and pulling stuff out, and setting it down in his front yard, going back in and repeating this multiple times. I counted three rifles and a handgun, and lots of ammo being amongst the pile in his front yard, before the fire department arrived and one of the firefighters made him stop. I wasn't listening to what they were saying, 
as I was hiding behind my fence again. I was terrified that this guy was going to jump to the conclusion that the guy with the microwave gun, whom he had called the police on, who had simply talked to him and did nothing else, might have had something to do with this. It was later discovered to be an electrical fire caused by faulty wiring. The house burnt down almost completely to the ground. There were some walls and ceilings still kind of standing, but it was completely unsalvageable. The guy moved away, and I didn't hear anything more about him. That was definitely one of the craziest things to happen out here. Definitely in my top ten. So this happened a little while back. For a bit of background, I'm a 30-year-old male with a young daughter. I live in a rural Northern California town, pretty much right in the epicenter of the gold rush. And I don't know if it's all the ways the land was taken, or the ways people killed for wealth back then, but it's always seemed to have a higher share of strange recluses and sovereign citizen types. That being said, this is not a haunting story or strange people of the woods, but it was by far the most frightening encounter I've ever experienced as a father. Some time ago, I ended up with an extra day off, and my wife and I decided to go out for a drive and check out a semi-local gun show. From time to time, I will get tables at them and have friends who do them regularly, so we went to visit as I'm always looking for obscure parts and pieces for old military weapons and I had some family that lived in the area of this show too. We had a hell of a winter last year, so unsurprisingly, it was a cold, gloomy day. We drove about an hour and knew the promoters, so we walked right in. As I was passing tables in search of the right stuff, I was carrying my daughter with me. She was very small and ridiculously cute, so everyone wanted to have a look and ask about her which is normal from what I've observed for parents. At times, you can even draw a small crowd, usually of sweet little old ladies and some grandpa types. There was one man who seemed a bit more excited than most his age, but he said he had worked as an EMT and an ICU for some years, so it seemed reasonable that he was so happy to see healthy babies. As the afternoon went on, he passed me a few more times, moving against the crowd and commented on how beautiful she was. As babies often do at that age, my wife soon needed to breastfeed our daughter. We went out to the car and had blinders in the back seat so she could have privacy and keep the baby from distractions. I turned on the heater, locked the doors, and then went back in to help a buddy sell during a busier point. About 10 to 15 minutes later, my phone starts ringing with my frantic wife on the other end. About three minutes before, I had noticed that law enforcement had gotten up and walked outside the show. It took me a minute to calm her down, but apparently the guy had followed us outside and been watching us closely. My wife got the sudden feeling that makes your hair stand up whilst she was feeding in the car. That was when she saw a shadow standing outside the door blocking her from opening and holding a mag light. At that moment, a sheriff pulled up who had also seen us go to the car. The officer asked what was going on, and the man tried to say he was talking to my wife, who rolled the window down slightly to explain that she was not and didn't want to either. The officer asked him his name, and when he turned around to run the name, he tried to scurry away. The name was Faye. Upon being detained, he gave his real name, and within one minute of calling it in, the man was turned around and arrested. It turned out he had felony warrants for kidnappings. The man was waiting for the nearby cars to leave. He was about to try and take my wife and infant daughter. Had that cop not been right there, who knows how it would have unfolded. Luckily there was a cop when we needed one. This is something that happened to me five or so years ago. 
I was fresh out of university with my degree in international development. I wanted to help underserved communities, develop meaningful projects, and see more of the world. I was young, and I was naive. Eager to get started, I took one of the first jobs that offered me a position. It wasn't something that I necessarily wanted to do, but it was adjacent to my interests, and, more importantly, took me to a place I'd never been before. I loved everything when I arrived. It was beautiful, sunny, and green. My new co-workers, all local staff, were amazing and so kind. My boss invited me to play soccer on Sundays with his family. My fellow project coordinator would go out dancing with me on the weekends. My roommate, a fellow expat working in development as well, was a fun and spunky woman I adored. I felt so blessed. Then, one day, it changed. I was walking downtown with a friend. There was a vegetable and fruit market that had great fresh produce directly from the farmers growing it. It was about a 20 minute bus ride from my apartment, so not close, but not incredibly far either. My friend and I loaded up and began walking over to a quiet corner to call a cab to help us haul our goods back. Then I heard it. Hey, hey, Miss 62, Rua Bruna. It took me a second to realize he was shouting my address. I turned around to see a man hanging out of his car, slowly crawling along the road with us. My friend recognized my address too. She turned to me and asked, Do you know him? I'd never seen him before. He kept shouting, yeah, you. You're living in the back house on the second floor, right? That made it even worse. I lived on a big suburban lot with two houses. One in the front, where my landlady and her family lived, and the second in the back. The second house was split into two apartments. The bottom floor housed two students, while I lived on the second floor with my roommate. You couldn't see the second house from the road much less the stairway that led to the second floor. My heart was pounding. I wanted to shout back at the guy, but I was scared. I was a 22-year-old woman living in a foreign country, and I didn't want to draw attention. I didn't know how people would react. I didn't know how he would react. So we walked. My friend tried to comfort me, saying that maybe he knew my landlady's family and I was probably the only redhead in the whole country. He could be a neighbor I hadn't met. This encounter didn't leave me. It stayed in my mind. A week or so had passed, and I stopped glancing behind my back whenever a car drove by. I started to feel secure. Then he showed up again. I was walking home from work. It was getting dark. My office was about a 15 to 20 minute stroll from my apartment perfect as a quick way to stretch my legs. I was halfway home when I felt someone watching me. Then, the slow crawl of a car sliding up beside me. I knew it was him without looking. Miss 62, Rua Bruna, he said, leaning out of his window, one hand on the wheel. Why are you shy? I ignored him and kept walking. There was no one around. It was getting dark. Come on, he cajoled. Let me give you a ride. I know where you live. Not reassuring, I started to feel my chest tighten. I wanted to call someone, but I didn't know exactly what he'd do if I reached for my phone. I was practically jogging now, but he sped up to match my pace. Listen, bitch. And now he was angry. His voice hard. You don't just ignore a man like that. I wondered what I'd do if he stopped the car. He looked fit, young. He could probably catch me. He could hurt me. So I did something that, in retrospect, seemed absolutely bizarre. I yelled at him, wildly, rapidly. I did it in my first language, not what they spoke in this country, not a language he would have ever heard, probably. I screamed curse words and threats, anything I could think of. 
I'll never forget the confusion on his face, but he did slow down, letting me run ahead. I could see a woman at a bus stop at the intersection ahead. If I got to her, maybe she'd help. Maybe he'd get scared off. By the time I got to the woman, he was gone. I kept walking home, looking behind me with every step. I told my roommate about what happened. She told me not to bother reporting it to the police, since they were corrupt and wouldn't do anything. When I told my boss, he told me the same. He said he had a baseball bat and would come whenever I called. I saw the man again two weeks later. He was sitting in his car, parked in front of the gates to my apartment. I was about to take out the trash but retreated before he could see me. I told my landlady, and when she went over to confront him, he drove off. This continued for weeks, not every day, but once or twice a week. He was always there, waiting. I took cabs to and from work. I never traveled alone. I barely slept, waiting for him to break in and kill me. My last week in abroad, he almost did. I went out drinking with a group of my friends, four of us in total. We were celebrating the end of my contract, and I was happy to go home in a few days. I couldn't wait to see my family. I couldn't wait to put an ocean between me and the man. We had beers at a local bar, a five to ten minute walk max from my apartment. When it started to get late, around one, we tried to get a cab, but it was impossible. The roads were jammed and people were everywhere outside. The cabs couldn't even get to us. So we thought, even though others warned us not to, let's walk home. It would be faster than calling a cab. We'll be fine. We're a group of four. No one will hassle us. We got halfway there when we had to cross the main road. There were no street lights. Not that kind of place. The road was absolutely empty. Not a single car in sight. We crossed the road. And after a few more minutes, we were backlit with the bright headlights of a car coming up. We glanced back. A cop car two men in the front, and I knew, even though I couldn't see from the bright lights in my eyes, he was driving. He was a cop. The jeep slowed as I knew it would. He rolled down the window to draw. Hey, Mr. Bruna, nice night here. Yeah. My friends immediately knew who it was. I could see how nervous they were. We were alone on a dark, empty street in the middle of the night. They were cops, so they were armed. No one would intervene, probably. It was too dangerous. You girls need a ride? He leered. His friend, who I could now see, had a huge grin across his face. My last few days, I thought, and this is how it ends. We sped up our pace. I don't know what our plan was, other than to get away. Then I heard one of the doors of the jeep open as the passenger jumped out. I don't think I've ever been so scared in my life. I didn't dare turn back to see. We were at the turn to my street now. Two minutes more to get to safety. The car was right behind us. Whoever had gotten out of the car was right behind us. Two of my friends were ahead now, while another clutched at my hand and dragged me along. Then, out of nowhere, another car appeared. They were coming from the opposite direction, illuminating us all, when they slowed to see what was going on. I've never been so grateful. It was an older couple and they looked concerned. I think they knew something bad was about to happen. I heard, not saw, the car door swing open. I almost got hit as they sped past us in a hurry. The other car stayed, watching. They offered to escort us home, driving alongside just in case. But I knew he wouldn't come back. Not tonight. I still took a cab with my friends to their place for the night. We took my roommate with us, just in case. Nothing happened after that. My last two days were uneventful, 
although I couldn't shake the feeling that he might show up at any given moment. Driving to the airport, all packed up and ready to go home, my cab got pulled over by a cop. My stomach dropped. I couldn't breathe. It wasn't him, although it could have been. It wasn't until I got on the plane, until I landed in my home country, that I finally felt the terror leave me. I still get nervous when the car drives up behind me, when men roll down the windows to shout at me. It's never him, but still, you never know. So a couple of years ago, I worked at a travel center. I would have been about 23 to 24 at the time. This one truck driver was always really friendly to me and always tried to make small talk. I worked in customer service, so I was just nice back, even though this guy was older than me. After a while, I started to think that maybe he had developed a crush on me, but I remained nice because no harm had been done. He overheard a co-worker and I talking about getting our hair done, and then the next time I saw him, he handed me a blank check with just my name on the page of the order line. He told me to use it for my hair that I wanted to get done. I told him we couldn't accept tips, and he kept insisting I take the check. After a little bit, I finally got him to stop trying to give me the check, and following this incident, I was a little shorter with him than usual because I didn't want him to get the wrong idea. Then one night, he pulled me to the side and asked to talk to me. I for sure thought he was going to ask me out. Well, the conversation was much more different than I thought it was going to be. He asked me if I believe in God, and I said yes. Then he asked if I go to church, and I told him not really. He then told me that God came to him with a list of people that he needed to purify, and I was on that list. He said that if I didn't let him purify me, then I would die in 30 days. I was shocked and didn't know what to do. I was so scared because I wasn't really sure what he meant by purify. I walked away from him and started doing a task outside. I come out of a door and he's standing there and says... I have been waiting for you. I'm instantly freaking out because I'm outside alone at night with this guy that just said I was going to die in 30 days. I just say, oh, and he tells me that I should really think about what he told me. I ended up telling my boss and she was really upset and took it as a death threat against me. But she couldn't ban the guy from the store because we didn't know his last name and she needed to see him in person to tell him. After about a month and a half, the guy comes in and tells me that he is sorry and didn't mean to scare me that night. I just said okay to him, and I kept my distance for the rest of the time I worked there. A couple of months ago, my coworker sends me a news article that has a picture of the truck driver and a headline about murder. I read the article, and it turns out this guy recently killed a lady because God told him to, and then he turned himself in. She was found tied up in his basement, and his only reason was that God told him to. I can't help but think I could have been one of his victims. So, I live in a relatively small town, in a really small country. I work as a waiter in a local restaurant. The restaurant is the oldest building in town, and has quite a rich history. It was built in late 1800, and was originally just a small shack. The house still had a really old feel to it. We have antiques strewn about the place. We even have the original floorboards from around 1940 in our upstairs dining area. 
All around, a creepy vibe in the house. I've been working there for almost three years now. This encounter happened last year. So it was a pretty busy night, and the place was quite packed. I was a greeter that evening, seating guests as they came in, taking down reservations in the book, as well as helping out during service upstairs. We had a table reserved for six people at half past seven in our upstairs dining area. The guests came in and I cheerfully said, Good evening, how may I help you? They told me the name they had made a reservation under, and I confirmed. All right, table for six right this way, I said as I picked up six menus and a drinks menu to show them to the table. Actually, there's just five of us this evening, said one lady. I replied, Oh, that's all right, it's not a problem. I then proceeded to put away the extra menu. I didn't think much of it, as party sizes change all the time, either adding or disbanding one member. I walked them upstairs and showed them to their table. They all sat down, and I started putting menus down for one side of the table, then moved to the other. I put down all five menus, but then there was a sixth person sitting at the end of the table. She had her back turned to me. All I could see was her long black hair, which draped over her shoulders. I just remember saying out loud, Oh, I seem to have forgotten the menu. I'll be right back. And I quickly made my way downstairs. Downstairs, I met my co-worker, who was attending the bar as I brought the table upstairs originally. I told her, Wow, okay. So apparently there are six now. Why would she tell me there are five when there obviously a six? She just looked at me and said, Are they a six? I remember them walking in, and I swear they were five. I just gave a shrug, grabbed a menu, and went back upstairs. I walked to the table, menu in hand, and noticed that there were only five at the table. I walked to the table and said, Oh, I thought you were a six. Wasn't someone sitting here? And I pointed at the empty seat. They all looked at me confused and said, No, there's just five of us. I was stumped. I swear I saw someone. A lady who sat next to the empty seat looked at me and said, I felt like someone was sitting next to me too. I got chills down my spine and went downstairs for a glass of water. I had to try to forget about it because I still had to finish service, but to this day, I always think about who or what sat down with my patrons. I worked as a cocktail waitress when I was 22. My shift was from 5 p.m. until 2 a.m. As a waitress, I'd become used to being harassed. Usually, it wasn't anything too over the top or frightening. Most customers were regulars who flirted innocently, just good-natured banter, nothing threatening or in any way sinister. Up until this night, I'd never felt a sense of danger from any of the customers I'd waited on. On this particular night, though, everything changed. I was being harassed by a creepy customer I'd never seen before. He'd said such inappropriate things to me that would really creep me out. He was relentless with his inappropriate remarks. At one point, as I was serving him his drink, he reached out and put his hand on my ass. After this happened, I never went back to his table again. If he wanted another drink, he'd have to go up to the bar and ask the bartender. I was through with waiting on the sinister creep. This happened back in 1978, so it was a time when I didn't have any recourse when things like this happened. The bartender only made customers leave when they were far too drunk to sit on a bar stool or at a table. Otherwise, we were on our own to deal with creepy customers. At closing, he finally left. Even though he was gone, I still felt such a sense of unease. 
I wasn't easily spooked, but this guy had really freaked me out. There was something just off about him. It took me nearly an hour after closing to complete the work and cleaning I had to do and get the bar ready for the following day. So it was about 3 a.m. as I made my way through the dark parking lot to get to my car. It was such a deserted and isolated place at night. The parking lot had woods that surrounded it. That, in of itself, was creepy. But as I was halfway to my car, out of the corner of my eye, I saw him. My heart began to pound as I realized that he had waited in the lot for me to come out. I realized I had to get to the safety of my car, or this man was going to do God knows what to me. I was young and fit, whereas this man was in his late forties and overweight. My thoughts were quickly assessing my situation. I didn't want to be kidnapped and murdered. That was the scenario I envisioned if this man got to me before I could get to my car. I knew I had to make a run for it. I ran as fast as possible. I jumped inside the car and locked the door. It wasn't one moment too soon because this man was now at my driver's side window, demanding me to roll it down. He kept yelling that he didn't want to hurt me. He only wanted to talk. He began to pound on the window as I fumbled with my keys to try to get the hell out of there. I began to fear that he'd shatter my window and get his hands on me. Finally, I got my car started, and as I put the car in reverse and backed out, he began to scream bloody murder. He was yelling for me to stop, because I'd run over his foot. My gut instinct told me that this man was faking the injury to get me out of my car, and I was not getting out of my car for any reason. I drove home as fast as I could, once home, I called the police. They came to take my report and got my description of the guy. At this point, I wasn't certain about whether I'd injured him or not. I explained all of this to the police officer. The police sent another officer to the parking lot to see if he was still there and suffering from an injury. He wasn't there. Nobody called the police to report a hit and run either. The police told me that I'd done the right thing for not falling for his ruse. I called my boss the following day and told him that I wouldn't be returning to work. I'd never been so frightened by anyone before. It was a night in which I truly feared for my life. There was no way I could make myself return to that job. That night still haunts my dreams. So about two months ago, I got hired to work in a gas station. Not a hard job, but the challenge was being open 24 hours. I worked the night shift, often alone, starting around 10pm and leaving shortly after 6am. At night, I met a wide range of people passing through or regular customers. Now don't get me wrong, it's a big gas station and we do have food that we make in the small back kitchen. I started to prepare the breakfast foods at around 3am because we had a morning rush of people around 4.30 every day like clockwork. I don't usually get all superstitious about certain times of night and preparing breakfast foods this early had become a routine by this point. But I remember this whole night just feeling off. I don't know why, but routine didn't feel, well, routine. Anyway, I get things ready and prepped for breakfast, seeing as I had no one in the gas station. We kept anything already made or packaged in the freezer, just before all the cold beverage crates. This door is completely metal, with the handle on the outside and a push button inside to get out. The freezer is also isolated in the back, so I'm unaware of anything going on outside of it. When you open the door, it's a clear path where it swings open, and it will stay open for the most part. If it does close, it doesn't close fully, leaving a decent gap open, which was also normal. 
To actually close it, you have to push on it from the outside, or pull it from the inside. So I'm in this freezer, getting what I need, and I see the door move slightly. No biggie, as I didn't prop it open or anything. In a matter of seconds after turning back to my task, this huge door slams shut, and I mean with a massive force. It was like someone threw their whole body against the door. I couldn't even slam it if I tried to. I didn't even have time to process the fact I jumped so badly, I dropped all the food, before I swung the door open and ran out to the open station. My immediate thought was that someone had come in, walked into the back office, and saw I was in the freezer. When I told my coworker that morning, we checked the cameras that are scattered around the station and matched the time it happened because we don't have one that points at the freezer door. She could tell I wasn't joking because I was visibly shaken up. Sure enough, aside from me, the place was completely void of people. I was scared so badly I stopped doing night shifts at that location and have since transferred to a smaller gas station that closes at midnight. I can't explain what happened that night, but I haven't been the same about working alone. I work at a little local business, and we are known for being really friendly and chatty with customers. It's kind of expected of us. Ever since I started working there at 17, there was this guy who had to be in his late 20s to mid 30s who would come in and talk to me in particular for long amounts of time. He would wear weird shirts that said something like, bearded for her pleasure. But I mean, to each their own fashion sense, I guess. He added me on Facebook at some point, and as a dumb teenager, I accepted. I would reply to his messages, but not too often. I had the feeling he had a crush on me, and I didn't want to lead him on. He started coming in, asking weirder things like, Are you going out drinking this weekend? Do you go to any clubs with your friends? I didn't want to delete him off Facebook, because I knew I'd have to face him at work again. My coworker and boss noticed he would linger sometimes for over an hour, just talking to me. If I was in the back, he would just stand around waiting for me to come up. About a year ago, he caught me when I was alone at the front and the store wasn't busy. So he decided to vent to me about how he recently got kicked out of a comic convention for trying to talk to a girl who had accused him of stalking her. He was convinced he did nothing wrong and was just trying to talk to her. But why else would he get escorted out of a venue by security if it was just a misunderstanding? I kind of forgot about this and he'd come in a couple more times since. I remember him casually asking me if I still lived on the corner of Main Street and I said yeah, not thinking much of it. Maybe two days later, I had the day off. I had a shower, then I changed in my room. Then I did my makeup right at the window, with the blinds wide open. I didn't think much of it, since I'm two stories up, but I guess I learned my lesson. I went downstairs and was so shocked to see him taking photos of my apartment building window. His phone was angled up towards my window. I think he saw me walking out but I had sunglasses on and walked away quickly. I removed him from Facebook, and he noticed. He messaged me within about two days after this happening. It's too coincidental not to be creepy, no? My co-workers were so weirded out when I told them. I didn't see him for a couple of months, and then one day he came in when I was working. He was so brief with me. If anything, he seemed almost angry at me. There was enough tension coming from him that when he left my new co-worker, who knew nothing about this, they were like, Whoa, what was that about? He was acting as if you just broke up with him. Could have been worse though. Chances are, he probably didn't get any good photos from his phone camera 
with all the sunlight glares and such. Used to hoping he has never creeped out my window before without me noticing. Oh, and come to think of it, there's this website where people write shitty things anonymously about other people, and I was posted on it. He, strangely enough, was the one who told me about this. I would have never noticed if he didn't tell me about it. The website was popular in like 2013. Also, my boyfriend was posted on there with the same style of writing. Thinking back, I wonder if this was him. I'm a 28-year-old male, but this happened when I was about 23. I worked at a mom and pop's pizza shop in Northern California. It's a small farm town and has a few suburbs near it. I kind of did everything since I knew the family. They trusted me running things while they were gone. This night, though, I was working deliveries and got the weirdest one of my life. Everything seemed fine when I took the order. The lady ordered anchovies on her pizza, and I always think that people who order that are weird as shit. She made a point to tell me that the pizza had to be hot when it got there, or she wouldn't pay for it. So I get the pizza and throw it in the warmer, and I drive to her house before any of the deliveries. I'd like to tell you guys that her house was really creepy and run down, but it looked like your average one-story new housing development home. I rang the doorbell and put on my fake-ass customer smile. As soon as she opened the door, I knew this was going to be bad. The haggard old lady, who looked like she was a smoker of 50 plus years, looked me dead in the eyes and said, It better be hot or I'm not paying, like I told you over the damn phone. I understand, ma'am. I made sure to stop by your place first, even though it was last on my list. Bring it in and sit it on the table, she said. And now I normally didn't go inside customers' homes because I read way too many stories on Reddit. But at this point, I'm just wanting to kill her with kindness and see where this goes. So I say, No problem. I also brought cheese and ranch for you if you need it. As soon as I opened the door, she grabbed the box and her hand was on the bottom of it, just rubbing it. It's not hot enough. You do this every time. I'm not paying for this shit. Not a single dime. One thing I have an issue with is my mouth. I don't know when to just shut up and try to understand where people are coming from. Look, lady, your house is a five-minute drive from our shop, and I stop by your place first. There is no way that your pizza is cold. If you refuse to pay, you're going to be 86 it, and I'll notate it on your account. She had immediately walked into her kitchen and came back out. She had an old pizza from a few weeks prior she had ordered from us, and threw it at me. Take your pizza and get out of my house. You're the devil. She yelled at me, and kept calling me Satan and the devil. Again, my mouth has no filter, and I can't control it. I try, but I fail every time. As I'm closing the back and laughing about how much I hate my job, I tell her, all right, ma'am, you will not be able to order pizza from us again. I hope you have a great day. God bless you and your house. She followed me outside to my car, screaming, You are the devil. And there are families out there just watching this go down. So I get into my car and start driving. Once I'm back, I tell my manager what had happened, and she told me that the lady already called in and screamed to her about what had happened. Her story was that I cussed her out and got her order wrong. My manager shut her down and said I'd never do anything like that. But here's the weirdest part. She whispered into the phone to my manager and repeated, Send him back. Send him back. Send him back. She called once a day, almost three months, just whispering this to whoever answered. She started driving by the restaurant and yelling, the devil works here. 
you're all going to hell. Now, I wasn't scared. I was just pissed and wanted to retaliate, because I can't tell you how many times she tried to follow me back to my apartment when I got off of work. One night, I pulled over and got out, just for her to stop her car in the road with the lights on, yelling, the devil is here. After this, I jumped back into my car and sped off. Luckily, after six months of dealing with this lady, I find out she was schizophrenic and bipolar, and she wasn't on her meds. Her daughter put her in a care home, but when she was cleaning out her house, she saw that her mom had pictures of me all over her bedroom wall, with the word, devil, written all over it. She found me and explained everything to me, and that was the end of it all. I work in an art supply store, and I've had my fair share of weird customers, both good and bad. But there's one who will always stand out in my mind as someone who genuinely terrified me. I was closing one night, and it had already started getting dark. I was on register with one of the person. A guy wearing a backpack approached me, asking if I knew where the calligraphy ink was. I told him it was on the very last aisle on the left. The man asked me if I could show him where it was. This was not an uncommon request, and there was someone else at the register, so I told him that I'd be happy to, and lead him over to the aisle. When we got to the aisle with the ink, he walked over to the low shelf I pointed him to, but didn't pick up anything or bend down to get a closer look. He just stood there, staring into space in the general direction of the shelf, he asked me if I could show him the ink. It was at this moment that I started to feel like something was off with this dude. He seemed to have zero interest in the item he had requested I show him. I looked closer. I noticed his hand was in his pocket at a weird angle, and his fly was down. I was suddenly very hyper aware of how far away the aisle was from anybody else in the store, and how it was a bit darker than the other aisles. I knew there were security cameras trained on this aisle because of the price of some of the items, but I doubted anyone was actually looking at it. Had he asked me to come to this part of the store on purpose, I was desperately trying to hide my rising panic behind a customer service smile so as not to tip off the guy that I knew there was something wrong. The man asked about another item, and I told him what aisle he could find it on. He asked me again if I can show it to him. I tried a couple of times to say, Oh, you can't miss it. It's just a few aisles down to the left. He insisted I needed to show him. I'm right behind you, I said. The man responded by insisting I walk in front of him, even though I had tried to direct him to the aisle without leading him there myself. I began walking towards the aisle, and I realized the path I was taking was blocked by a large ladder, a ladder the man wouldn't be able to get past but I would. I took off running, squeezed past the ladder, and dodged into an aisle, immediately finding another customer and asking them if they needed any help. As I was trying to stall by talking to the customer, I noticed the man walk past the aisle several times, back and forth. I realized he must have been waiting for the people to leave, or for me to walk out of the aisle alone. I frantically radioed my manager to meet me at the aisle. I told him about the man who had been following me. He responded by saying he saw him leave the store and then walk off to a nearby fast food chain. I tried to laugh him off as some random weirdo, but I was shaking for the rest of the night. Funnily enough, when we were later discussing weird customers we'd seen, someone described a guy who sounded vaguely similar to the man coming in. This time, wheeling around a random old rusty shopping cart full of backpacks and abandoning it in the store. Apparently, this guy did this multiple times and got angry when confronted about it. I can't help but wonder if it's the same weirdo, and if so, why the hell is he hanging around in an art supply store?
Hey guys, I hope you enjoyed that one. Don't forget to leave a like and comment. Let me know what you thought of the stories. Subscribe if you haven't, and make sure to turn on notifications so you're always notified whenever I release a new video. I want to give a quick shout out to my patrons for supporting the channel. So a huge thanks to Linda, Shan, Jody, Sarah P, James Gargano, Gemma Allen, Monica Lavalese, Alex, Courtney Maxwell, Kathleen Fenton, Jill Hutchins, and Elena Renee. If anyone else wants to check out the perks of my Patreon or my other social media, all my links are in the description. Thanks for listening, guys. I hope you have a great weekend. I'll see you in the next one. When I was 18, a friend and I heard this story of when Charles Manson was released from prison, that he wanted to go to the Devil's Staircase in a town three hours away. There was also a ghost town. The story is that this is a staircase to hell, hidden somewhere nearby. It was also mentioned a man was watching the area on his behalf. Of course, being 18 and stupid, we decided to meet my friend in the bigger town outside of it and head out. We pulled in to see a very small town with a row of boarded up homes, and maybe a store but from decades ago. We parked on the side of the road just to take a peek around. Looking back, I'm so glad this was during the day. We walked about ten steps and we see a man riding bareback on a horse towards us. He looked dirty and had a face that was worn. He only had a few teeth, and he asked us what we were doing there. He first asked, Are you the kids that came here that burned down the old church a few months ago? They had a car that looks just like yours. We answered that we were on our way to a town a couple hours west, and noticed signs leading here. He knew of this town, and said that he's not a fan of anyone there. He asked if we were from there, and we told him no. He then proceeded to say, It's a good thing you aren't from there, or I'd have to shoot you. Got the plots dug up already. Of course we are shitting ourselves, apologizing for even stopping. And he says, Tell everyone is Winston. I'm coming with a gun. Then rode off. We ran to our car and got the fuck out of there. A few years later, I was telling this story to a new friend from a larger town nearby that I mentioned earlier. She said that her and her friends went out there to drink, since it's riddled in old coal mines, and it was great to drink at because they were underage. They got out there to find 20 expensive cars that were immaculate, parked all over the land, they saw a huge fire in the distance, but got freaked out and got out of there. 
She believes that there may have been a satanic ritual occurring because she knew of the Devil's Staircase story. One thing that stuck with me is what the man on the horse said just as he rode off. Tell your friends to stay the fuck out of Tagus. And we absolutely did. Ever since I was a kid, I remember my grandma denouncing horror of any kind. Ghoulish Halloween masks, haunted houses, scary movies. I had attributed this aversion to her background and faith. She is Hispanic and a devout Catholic. She believes anything horror related is wrong, evil, you name it. So imagine my shock and curiosity when my grandparents shared a bombshell. Back in 1974, my grandpa convinced my grandma to see the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. This would be her first and last scary movie. The weekend after the movie, my grandpa, grandma, my then toddler aged mother and my aunts and uncles decide that they will go horseback riding for the first time. Since everyone lived in Wisconsin, my family made the journey to a farm about two hours away. For the most part, everyone is in high spirits. Who can say no to a family adventure on a crisp, autumn, Wisconsin day? Despite the other's excitement, my grandma is worried. Since she doesn't care for horses, she chooses to stay behind on her own with my mother. When my family arrives at the farm, it is three o'clock. According to my grandma, she watched everyone get settled up and then slowly ride off into the tangle of trees. The guy leading my family called out that the ride would last less than two hours, mentioning different trails, the need for breaks, things of that nature. My grandma figures everyone will be back by five o'clock. She waits with my mother in the car, playing games, reading storybooks, and trying to silence her bubbling anxiety. Needless to say, five o'clock comes and goes, no sign of my family. By this time, my mother has fallen asleep, which leaves my grandma with no way to distract herself from her worries. Finally, when six o'clock rolls around, she calls to a farmhand from a car window. There's no way she's leaving the safety of her vehicle. She demands to know why her family hasn't returned yet, when five o'clock is long since passed. By now, darkness has begun bleeding into the Wisconsin sky. The farmhand assures her that everything is okay, and that extra paths are taken throughout the ride. He tells her that her family should return soon. Now keep in mind, this was way before cell phones were a thing. Also, a week before, she had seen her first scary movie, and it scared the shit out of her. At this point, my poor grandma feels like she's living out a scene from the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. She tries to contain her worry, and begins a hushed, fearful prayer, until the flash of lightning that is soon followed by ear-splitting thunder. The noise wakes my mother, who starts to cry. My grandma must now not only ponder the frightening question of where her family went, but she also has a stressed, howling two-year-old to deal with. It is now reaching seven o'clock. The storm is growing more ferocious by the second. My grandma has to pee and her bladder feels like it's going to explode. But between the roar of the storm and the images of crazed country maniacs plaguing her mind, she refuses to leave the vehicle. She plans in her head that if they aren't back by 7.30, she's going to leave and find the nearest gas station to phone for help. Again, no cell phones during these days. 7.30 comes, her family hasn't come out of the woods. As she's scrambling around the cars for her keys, she realizes my grandpa never gave them to her. The pound of a fist against her window shakes her from the whirlwind of panic. 
That panic amplifies by a million when she notices a sizable, brawny man peering in at her. He's wearing a jacket and the hood covers his head. My grandma says that, by now, it felt like someone had pushed a button and sent the whole world into slow motion. Everything crawled by at a snail's pace. Why don't you and the little one come inside? His words are authoritative and carry no hint of warmth. He isn't speaking from a place of concern. He's ordering my grandma into the farmhouse. All my grandma can do is shout, Where is my family? The man responds gruffly, We're looking for them. My grandma orders him to call the police. The next words the man said made my grandma literally piss her pants. We don't need the police. As he turns to go back inside the house, he says, You and the baby can come inside whenever you're ready. My grandma starts to sob, wholly convinced that her family has been brutally murdered and that she and her baby will be next. In the chaos of this moment, she hears someone calling her name, but because of the pitch black darkness and her profound fear, she knows she must be hearing things. Then she hears her name again, this time even louder. Dora, help me. It's my grandpa's voice. When she realizes this, she puts my mom in the back seat, grabs the wooden baseball bat my grandpa keeps under his seat, locks the doors, and then exits the car. Keep calling my name. I can't see you, she cries. After what feels like an eternity, she follows my grandpa's voice to his location. When she gets to him, she realizes my grandpa needed help because he is guiding my aunt across the high, rain-soaked grass. She hurt her ankle. They are both drenched from mud and rain and covered in scratches. The rest of my family is nowhere in sight. Before my grandma can assume the worst, she hears my uncle calling for my grandpa. One by one, everyone shuffles out of the wild woods and through the tall grass. Everyone is soaked in mud and injured in some capacity. Cuts, gashes, limping, unsteady. All are shaken as well. When they finally make it back to their vehicles, the sounds of running engines and the flood of headlights gets the attention of the man inside the farmhouse. The farmhouse door swings open and the brawny man comes to stand on the porch. With an amused chuckle, he draws. Oh, you all made it out of there. My grandpa shouts. That dumb asshole left us out there and never came back. All the man says in response is, I'll have to talk to him about that. You all can come inside. His freakishly flippant and joking attitude sinks into his words. He knows damn well they aren't going into his house. My grandma begs my grandpa to leave and get them out of there. With that, my family tears out of there as fast as humanly possible. Once my family was back home and safe, my grandpa explained what had happened. During the ride, the guide led them deep into the woods to a creek, where the horses stopped for a drink. As the horses rested, the guide told my family he had to go do something and would be back in 20 minutes. My family thought this was strange, and my grandpa even anxiously joked, You're coming back, right? The guide simply gave a low chuckle and took off on his horse. Twenty minutes came and went, and the guide didn't return. My family continued to wait, as they had no idea where to go. They could see the blackening sky above them. They would have to make it out on their own. As my family rode off, they tried to remember the path back to the farm. They wandered aimlessly. Eventually, rain started to fall. Pulsing lightning and the crash of thunder spooked the horses. Everyone but my grandpa was thrown off. 
When my grandpa climbed off his horse to help the others, his own horse galloped away as well. From there, it was a nightmare trying to navigate the woods while wounded and roaming through a thick void of darkness. The only advice I can give you is this. If you're going horseback riding, you better make sure it doesn't become a horseback ride from hell. So, this is a story for which I was very young. It was a few years after I was born, so I don't remember a whole lot, only bits and pieces. I'd say that I was five or six years old. My parents filled in the gaps for me, so I'm going to tell the whole version of the story, both my parts and theirs. We were living in an old farmhouse at the time. My parents were poor so they rented from a landlord that owned a few small properties in the area. My dad worked in the steel mill on the midnight shift, so he worked some odd hours. This is extremely important, because it might be the only reason that we're still alive, and that I'm able to write the story today. So one night, we heard a crash, followed by someone saying, Help! Help! He's going to get me! Help me! We jolted out of bed and were fully awake in an instant. I was sleeping in my bed with my parents at the time because I'd been having awful night terrors. My dad, who had just been switched from midnight shifts to days, jumped out of bed and cautiously made his way down the stairs, grabbing a stoking pick from the fireplace in the living room. He got to the door when he heard it again. Help. Oh my god, he's coming. The woman's voice on the other side of the door began sobbing hysterically. We have to help her. Open the door, said my mother. My mom is an inherently good woman, who always goes out of her way to help people every single day of her life. She reached for the deadbolt, but my dad stopped her. He shot her a look and said cautiously through the door, What's going on? Who's after you and where is he? The voice through the door responded, I just need to get in before he gets here, please. More sobs. My father turned on the porch light and said, Stay up on the porch with your back against the door. He then opened the deadbolt, but not the chain lock. He slipped a brick that we used as a doorstop through the door. Take this and use it to defend yourself if you need it. I'll be right on the other side of this door, and if he comes after you, I'll come out and help. In the meantime, I'm calling the police. They'll be here soon. This is when the woman started to absolutely lose her mind. She began slamming her whole body into the door with mindless fury. What is wrong with you? Let me in this house right now. What kind of people are you? My dad forced the door shut and clicked the deadbolt again. He immediately called the police and they came within 10 minutes. When they arrived, the woman was simply gone. The doorstop brick was sitting on one of the porch steps. My parents gave a description of the events and the woman as best as they could. We tried our best to get sleep in the following nights, but my mom and dad checked all the locks and windows several times throughout the night. I don't remember understanding what happened, but I remember thinking that my parents were acting strange and wondering why they didn't help this woman. I thought that the man snuck up and got her while we were calling the police. A few days later, we found out that the police had been called for a similar situation. My dad's brother-in-law worked in law enforcement and told us that this time, the police had happened to have a car down the street and arrived without lights and sirens. The officers saw the woman that my parents had described at the front door on top of the porch. When they began walking, a man dashed out of the bushes from the side of the porch. They chased him down pretty quickly and recovered a long kitchen knife from the bushes where he had been hiding. 
The man and the woman had been working together to try to gain entry to houses. The police summarized that the woman would get help to open the door and let her in, and then let her partner in. God only knows what he would have done once he got inside. Once I heard this story and put it together with my memories of the event, it sent chills down my spine. Imagine what would have happened if my dad had been working the midnight shift, or if he had been asleep. He grew up in a very bad neighborhood, Gary, Indiana, so he was always overly cautious about people around him. Usually it was mildly irritating, but this time it may have saved our lives. My dad told me about this incident that happened in the early 50s when he was a young child. My dad couldn't have been much older than 5 or 6 years old when it happened. He grew up on a large family farm that was fairly isolated. The nearest neighbor was at least a quarter mile away, through rolling, wooded hills. There was no electric service on the farm back then, and they didn't get phones until the summer of 1984 so they were effectively on their own. One day, Grandpa had sent my uncle to the feed mill to collect payment for that year's harvest. He was told to get it in cash. Grandpa wanted to pay that year's taxes and then deposit the rest in the bank. My uncle brought the money home. That night, around 2 a.m., they were awakened by a car parked on the property with its headlights aimed at the house. Grandpa rolled out of bed and crawled along the floor to my uncle and dad's bedroom and woke up my uncle. In almost complete darkness, they ran down the stairs, my uncle ran out the back door, and my grandpa ran out the front. My grandpa threw the door open and ran outside so fast, he pretty much leapt over the steps and went to confront the guy. The driver of the car was already most of the way up to the house. He saw my grandpa coming with my uncle close behind, and he turned and hauled ass. Grandpa wasn't far behind. He made it to his car and he was trying to drive away, and my grandpa was grabbing the steering wheel trying to stop him. He managed to break loose, and grandpa chased him a short distance down the road, but he finally got away. At that point, my grandpa and my uncle noticed the second car at the end of the block speeding away. The intruders managed to get away that night. Thankfully, no one was hurt. The next day, my grandpa and uncle reported what had happened to the sheriff. The sheriff pretty succinctly told them to buy rifles. He said to them, If it happens again, do what you have to do to defend yourselves. The next stop they made was to the hardware store to buy rifles. One for each of my uncles and one for grandpa. There was never a repeat of that incident. And as far as my dad knows, the late night visitors were never caught. A few years ago, I was on a dating site where I matched with a police officer. I thought his dog was cute and figured this was my opportunity to finally pet a canine police dog. I was quickly disinterested after listening to him complain about his divorce. I don't recall the details, but I remember it being very apparent that he was the problem in that relationship. I was also really grossed out by how he fetishized me for my big chest, tattoos, and colorful hair. I was very upfront and told him I wasn't interested, and that he was setting off some red flags for me. He begged me to give him a chance, but I said no, and then I blocked his number. A few days later, I get a knock on my door at around midnight. My heart dropped into my ass, it startled me so much. I look out my peephole and see a stranger holding food. It's an Uber Eats delivery driver. 
I tell him through the door I didn't order food, but he said someone else ordered it and knew my name. I asked who ordered it, and he said a name I didn't recognize. I tell him I don't want the food, and I gave him directions to the dumpster to throw it out, because at this point, I have no idea if he actually is from Uber. Later on, I'm going through my dating app matches, and realize it was the cop's name. I go through my blocked messages, and this guy had messaged me a lot. The last message, I hope you liked your dinner. I decide it's best to unblock this man so I can keep an eye on what he's saying, in case I need to be worried about my safety, or if I'm going to need to go buy some bear mace and drop a cop. A few weeks later, I'm at work. I get a call from a number I don't recognize. I answer because I assume it's a new client. The voice on the other line says, Hey Rachel, I'm at Starbucks across the street. What's your drink order? I ask, who is this? I don't have you in my appointment book. Assuming it's a regular and I made a scheduling error. He says his name and again, my heart drops into my ass. How does he know where I work? I ask him how does he know where I live and work and he explains that he did a reverse image search on my photos from my dating profile. He found my social media and my Yelp page from my salon. Then he looked up my address from there. I tell him I'm calling his station and reporting him for stalking. And if he ever comes near me, I will consider it a threat. And I will be ready to physically defend myself. And after all that, he still begs me to give him a chance. I hang up, call the police station he works for, and put in the complaint. They won't even let me email screenshots of my creepy messages. I could tell nothing would be done. The lady literally said, Oh, I'm sorry. He's going through a lot right now. They are literally treating him like he's the victim. He's mostly left me alone, but I was so scared living alone for the first time in my life. I have a semi-popular meme page on Instagram with about 8,000 followers. I sifted through and found potentially five of his accounts. I blocked them and moved on. This was several years ago, but all these memories came flooding back when I noticed a familiar profile photo on an account who commented on a post. I must have missed an account of his when blocking. I had posted a photo of me holding two big tunas I caught on a fishing trip, and he commented, God, I wish I was one of those fish. I'd love to know what it's like to be held by you. I tell this story to a lot of people because of how bizarre it is. Here's some background. This took place in 2007. I know that because I was in fourth grade and I was nine at the time. We live in a large neighborhood, and at that time, it was surrounded by my farmland. My house is a one-story house. When you stand in the doorway of my room, you can see the front door, the kitchen, and my brother's room straight ahead. Turning your head to the left, you can see the living room and my parents' room. You can get to my parents' room to the front door in less than a minute. For a while, we had been getting calls from jail. We had a home phone that had caller ID. Three times a day for a week, our phone would ring and the caller ID would say, Jail. We had no relation to jail at all. No police came to the house. Nothing. We never answered. My mom always said that if they don't leave a voicemail, then it's not important. They never left one, so we didn't answer. They always seemed to call in the morning, afternoon, and evening. Well, one day, we only got one call. We thought that was weird, but didn't care. That night, I was in bed, playing quietly, because my sister, who was an infant at the time, was sleeping in my room. I remember playing with my Madeline doll, and I decided to go to bed. 
It was around 9 to 10 p.m. at the time. When I put my head on the pillow, the doorbell rang. Well, this was the time my dad would be getting home, so I thought it was my dad playing with me. The doorbell rang again, and again, and again. And I got scared and clutched my doll and ran into my mom's room. She was awake and watching TV. I told her someone was ringing the doorbell. She paused the TV and the doorbell rang. It just kept ringing. She immediately got my brother and sister. The ringing stopped. She looked through the peephole and saw a black figure of some sorts, but couldn't make it out. She did mention she didn't know if it was a person or something else. She was afraid to turn the porch light on. She went back to her room and the doorbell continued, and then knocking. And it didn't sound like someone was trying to break in. It sounded like casual ringing and knocking, but it just kept going. Then it became faster and more intense. I got so scared I cried. Mommy, make it stop. Make it stop. I cried to her. My mom called my dad to get home now. He was 30 minutes away, and we endured intense ringing and knocking for what seemed like an eternity. The longer we waited, the more vicious it sounded. Then, it stopped. We sat in silence, with the only light being on the TV, and then the garage opened. My mom had the sense of fear in her eyes as the garage went up. She held onto my infant sister tightly and then braced herself to protect us. Anne? It was my dad. Tell me when you arrive. My dad didn't see anything. His lights were on when he pulled into our street, but he drove slowly. He saw no car drive past him or anyone. My brother and I started to head back to our rooms when the ringing started again. We froze. The ringing and knocking continued viciously and my dad ran towards the door and swung it open. No one was there. Nothing. My dad ran around the house. Nothing. The calls from jail stopped. We keep our porch light on now, and whenever the doorbell rings, I get nervous and keep quiet. I am afraid that one day, it might happen again. My dad grew up on a forestry in Queensland, Australia, as the son of a forest ranger. My whole life, we've spent a lot of time out in that forest, camping and driving through parts of forestry that only rangers would travel, and only occasionally. One place that Dad loved to take us was a little farm in the middle of the forest that was impossible to find if you didn't know the way. Locals knew the place as Spike's Hut. Spike was a local farmer who would live there for decades, up until the 90s. He had a reputation for being abrasive, violent, bigoted, and not concerned with the laws of men. He had a habit of approaching guys in bars who were wearing earrings and tearing them straight out. And there were a few stories about people who displeased him disappearing. Basically, Spike was not a nice guy, and his farm and hut reflected that pretty well. Dad would take us out there every time we visited the forest, and the hut would be more and more dilapidated, but the vibe was always the same. That straight up feeling of being watched, even though Spike was long gone. As I got older, I became more aware of the signs of life in the place when we went to visit. There would be 44 gallon drums full of smashed beer bottles, fire pits with reasonably fresh coals. Someone was definitely out there. God knows why, since this place was literally a snake bit at that point. But Dad didn't seem concerned. One trip when I was a teenager got strange real quick. My friends and I all piled into my Dad's 4x4, and we were driving through the bush to Spike's, so Dad could tell his scary Spike stories and freak us out. 
We drove onto the property and something immediately caught my eye. Up on the hill opposite Spike's hut, there was what appeared to be a cowboy slumped against a log, hat over his face taking a nap. Something about his body position looked unnatural and uncomfortable. It wasn't the way you'd be sat if you were taking a casual nap in the middle of a workday. And even if it was, there was no reason for anyone to be out there. The farm was long defunct and there was no forest business to be taken care of on this property. I pointed it out to my dad and instead of letting us out of the car at Spikes as usually did, he said he wanted to keep driving through the farm to show us something. He maintained that it was nothing but that if the figure was still there when we came back through, we'd stop and check it out. Of course, whatever he wanted to show us seemed totally made up, as he just drove through the forest a bit. And when we came back, I spotted the slumped over cowboy again, never having moved an inch, still in that same unnatural position. I yelled out to my dad to stop, reminding him of his promise, but instead, he acted like he couldn't hear me, locked the truck doors, and drove off the farm much faster than he ever drove on those dirt forest roads. My friends and I all looked at each other in confusion, but we knew that when it came to this area, questioning my dad was futile at best, dangerous at worst. My dad denied that any of the events of that day ever happened after that, but my friends and I were still curious about what was going on there. So a few months later, we went camping on our own and set out to find Spike's hut. It took hours of driving through the forest to find the gate to Spike's property, but eventually we found it without Dad's help. Something was off once we got there, more so than usual that day. My mates jumped out of the car but were suddenly frozen. Not wanting to walk any closer to the hut, for no visible reason, the vibe was just wrong that day and it felt like we had walked into something that didn't belong to us. The tug in my gut to get out was so strong, but I spent two hours finding the place, and I was going to explore it. One of my friends acted brave and walked from the car to the hut with me, quietly acknowledging more and more signs of inhabitants, with knowing nods between us. We said nothing to the others, but we were on high alert. It felt like someone could be back any minute, or that they had never left and were watching us as we poked around the debris. We walked up to the side of the hut, to find kind of a small shed with three walls. I heard my friend's voice go squeaky as he called me over to look inside. On the ground was a pile of ashes from what looked like a cooking fire, and confirming this was the presence of a giant makeshift grill, made from cross-hatched wire sitting over the fire hinged to the shed wall. As I'm looking at this setup, I figure that whoever has been here has been hunting and cooking large chunks of their kill over this fire. Pretty clever, actually. But then, my stomach dropped. As my eyes traveled down from the grill to the ground, I saw a baby sock, tiny, pink, and terribly out of place. Then another, then a shirt and a ribbon from a child's hair, all sitting right besides the ashes on the ground, next to a woman's weekly Christmas cookbook. That's when the alarm bells in my head went off, and I rounded up my mates and got out of there. Some ranger or crazy old bushy hanging out at that trashed hut was one thing, but there was absolutely no reason for a baby to be out there, and there's no way anything good had come of having a child's clothes right by a huge fire and grill. When we got back to the campground, we couldn't shake the rotten feeling of being watched, and all of us were so unsettled that we packed up our shit and decided not to stay the night. When I got home, I told my dad about it. He just shook it off, saying weird stuff happens out there. Being young and dumb, I never thought to look up missing persons in the area in an attempt to explain either the cowboy or the kid's clothes, but I can tell you I will never make the mistake of going out to Spikes without my father again.
Over ten years ago, I used to live in a peninsula in Norway. It was quite idyllic, actually, as we, me, my sister and my mom, lived within walking distance of a beach. We had a short and incredibly narrow driveway that led to the house, and the only window in the house facing the driveway was my bedroom window. I was about nine or ten at the time when the incident happened. I was in the living room watching a show on Jetix. I think it was around 6 to 7 p.m., as it got pretty dark fast at that time of year in January. I had been sitting there for hours when my mother told me to go to my bedroom and watch TV there as we were having guests. I grabbed my things and went inside my room. I remember the room felt really cold, so I turned on the heater and went back out to the living room to get some candy or something like that. On my way out the door, a sudden feeling of dread washed over me and I had this feeling that someone had been watching me. I don't know how to explain this feeling, but it was as if I subconsciously could see someone outside my window from the corner of my eye. But I didn't realize it until I grabbed the door handle. I turned around quickly and glanced at the window. Nothing. I felt really stupid and brushed it off as me just being paranoid or dramatic. I got my candy and went back into my room. The first thing I noticed was that my bedroom window had been slightly opened and I didn't remember opening it. I figured maybe my mom did it. Suddenly, I heard a sort of scratching sound outside my window and this time I froze still. I couldn't process what was going on. There was a person outside my window. His face was glued to the glass, and he was holding his hands on each side to get a better look inside my room. As my window was quite far up when standing outside, I could only see his head. For a brief second, I thought maybe he was one of the guests my mom was talking about, but I'd never seen him in my entire life. He was just staring at me. I couldn't move. Or maybe I could, but I didn't want to. I was too scared. He looked like he was in his 40s, and I remember him having really dark circles under his eyes. He just stood there for what felt like an eternity, and then suddenly widened his eyes and continued to stare. This scared the life out of me, but I managed to shout, Mom! The man panicked and disappeared quickly. As I was in the middle of telling my mom that this man was standing outside my window, our doorbell rang. My mom answered the door and wouldn't let me out in the hallway to see who it was. I just remember her looking uneasy when she came back. A few months later, that same man was arrested and charged with murder after his neighbors complained about a horrific smell coming from his apartment. The police discovered the decomposing body of a 13-year-old girl in the attic who had been murdered by him. She was last seen in her bedroom and had been missing for several days. After all these years, my mom told me what the man said at the door. He told her that someone had ordered takeout and he wanted to check if it was the right address. This being a small peninsula, she recognized him from a small vegetable shop and then realized he was lying. She got scared and quickly told him no one had ordered anything. A year later, we moved to the city, and only now I fully understand why. I truly believe that if my mom had not been there, I would not be alive today. Sometimes I feel guilty for the girl's death, and wonder if she would be alive and well today if I had been taken instead. So I've been a career paramedic, but this happened when I'd only been one for five years. This has never left me to this day, and I shit you not, it happened exactly like this. I was driving home on a rural highway one rainy afternoon. It was really pouring, 
and traffic had slowed to about 50 miles per hour. I was following two vehicles, and we rounded a bend in the road as a small sports car on the opposite side crossed the center line and hit the small SUV that was leading the three of us vehicles on my side of the road. Immediately I pulled over and called 911, and it was a bad one. I got out to check on everyone. There was wailing coming from the SUV on the side of the road. That's always a good thing, because people are breathing. So I went down into the field, past the ditch, to check on the sports car. There were two young guys in the car. The force of the impact had driven the engine to where the front passenger seat should be. The passenger was still buckled, his crumpled hand grabbing the oh shit handle overhead. The entire section of car shoved into the back seat area. The back of the car had peeled away as had the passenger's top of his head. His jawbone jutted out raw and jagged. He was clearly deceased, but I felt for a pulse anyway. All while trying to listen to the gasping, ragged, dragging breaths of the driver. No pulse on the passenger. I tried to figure out how to deal with the driver, but there was nothing I could do. The car had literally wrapped around him and it would take an extraction team time to get him out. Listening to his dying breathing, I apologized out loud to him, telling him that I couldn't do more. I told him I was sorry to leave him, but others needed my help too. In my heart, I knew he'd never make it, so I went to render aid where it was needed. I did what I could for the family in the SUV, Emergency medical people and fire services got to the scene and took over. But the whole day, those two guys in the red sports car stayed on my mind. That night, I was home alone and getting ready for bed, with just the bedside lamp on, and I heard something in the hallway. It got louder as it came closer down the dark hallway, towards my open door. I absolutely froze. A broken hand curled around the frame of my doorway, and then, that kid from the passenger seat was standing there, busted up just like he was in the car. I'm totally serious. He looked at me, and I can't recall the exact words of what he said, but it was something along the lines of, Hey, my friend wants you to know he understands. He wants you to know he's okay. We both are. Thank you for trying. He stood there for a few more seconds, just looking at me. And then he stepped back into the shadows, let go of the door frame, and I listened to him, dragged back down the hallway into nothing. I turned on every damn light I could. I slept with the lights on for two full weeks. I clipped out their death notices from the paper later that week. Turns out, they were both high school seniors on their way home from a wrestling tournament. Their car hydroplaned from what the investigation determined. I would have never recognized the blonde haired kid had he come to me as his healthy, unwrecked self. It freaked me the hell out he came to me busted up. I still have the newspaper clippings. I'll never forget them. Nor the ghostly visit. In 2014, I moved to England from Canada to gain work and travel experience, and also to find myself. I ended up living in Essex with three other roommates. They were all women, all a bit older than I was. I was 24 at the time. Megan was 31, Cherry was 34, and Cassie was 38. Megan was from New York, Cherry from New Jersey and Cassie from Poland. All four of us shared this three-story flat. The back of our home was the living room and kitchen. The back wall was complete glass that looked out into the garden. The garden was completely fenced in. The house had an interesting dynamic to say the least. I could tell tons of stories from that time in my life. 
I adored all my roommates except for Cherry. After living with Cherry for seven months, I was over her antics. One day I came home from work. I locked the door, made myself something to eat, and went up to bed. I brought some work home with me, so I was in my nightie with all these papers around me and my headphones on, jamming out. I had headphones on because Cherry was out to dinner with work friends. That meant booze. And then soon after that, a tantrum was sure to come. I just didn't want to have to listen to her crazy scream crying. So I was working away, completely focused, until I felt something. I looked up to see a man standing over me. I didn't register it right away and passively said, Cherry's room is on the second floor, and then continued to work. Cherry, on the regular, would bring strange men home. He didn't leave. Again, Cherry's room is downstairs, you. He then interrupts. I am not here for Cherry. A cold chill iced my veins. My fight or flight kicked in just then. I started surveying the situation. I looked him up and down. He had a bottle of Prosecco in one hand and a knife in the other. He was about five foot ten, wild muddy brown hair, and black eyes. He had a light blue polo shirt on and one side of his collar was popped up. He had a distinct Manchester accent. Once I focused in, I realized his eyes were black because his pupils were completely dilated. Shit, I was in trouble. I needed an escape plan. Unfortunately, this man was standing between me and my bedroom door. I needed to get downstairs, but I needed him to think it was his idea. I decided to play along. Just then, he used his knife to pop the cork. Prosecco started flowing onto my carpet. I said, Oh no, let's clean that up. I prefer to drink out of a proper flute anyways. He nodded, replying, Yeah, you're a proper classy bird. Let's go. I tried to act as normal as possible. I tried not to show that I was shaking all over and tried to gain control over my breathing. We took the long journey down to the main floor of my flat, all three floors. He had the back of my nightie bunched up in one hand, and I could feel the point of the knife graze my back with his other. I was trying to playfully speak with him as we walked down the stairs. I couldn't tell you what I was saying. I was most likely rambling. I couldn't hear anything over my heart beating in my ears. We got to the bottom of the stairs, where there is a hallway to my left that leads to the front door. On my right, which was much closer to us, was the kitchen and living room. We made our way into the kitchen, and I pointed to the cabinets that had wine glasses. He said he knew where they were and started towards them, my kitchen table in between us. It was time to run. I burst into a sprint down the hallway towards the door, my hands fumbling over the locks shaking and sweating. I swung the door open and saw two men walking across the street. They must have been walking home from the nearby train station. I called out to them for help and suddenly I was flung onto the ground. Little pebbles piercing my skin sent sharp pains where they jabbed. The intruder pushed me out of the way to run away and escape. One of the men chased after the intruder while the other one said for me to go inside while he surveyed my home and told me to call the police. I locked the doors and I called the police. While I was on the phone with the dispatch, I maniacally ran around the house to double check all the doors and windows were shut. Suddenly, I hear a loud bang on my door. I informed the dispatch of the banging and she informed me that the police weren't there yet. I thought it might be one of the gentlemen who helped me, so I went to look out the eye hole. It was him, the intruder. He came back. He's banging on my door, screaming that I had his glasses and that he was not done with me. I absolutely freaked out. The dispatcher attempted to calm me down, but I was losing my ever-loving mind. She then said, They are pulling onto your street now. You should hear their sirens. I did. Thank God. The intruder then blasted off. One officer jumped out of the passenger side while the car was still moving and chased after him. 
the second officer came into my home, interviewed me and the two gentlemen. He collected evidence and took photos. After some time of him being there, Cherry came home and freaked out. Once the situation was explained to her, she said, Oh my god, that could have been me. Yeah, thanks Cherry. The next morning, I was called in to identify a man they had in custody. I pointed him out. I went into a little room and the officer pulled out an evidence bag. He asked me if these items were mine. They were. It was my underwear and photos taken from my home. The officer informed me that the intruder had been stalking me for some time now. He estimated three months. He had made a nest outside our home on top of a hill that overlooked our living room and kitchen. He was a known sex offender and drug dealer. The police officer then told me how lucky I was to get out, practically unharmed. Others weren't so lucky. I would love to run into those two gentlemen again. Every day, I am thankful for them. This happened last year between Christmas and New Year's Eve. I'm from the French Caribbean, so it's not unusual to scuba dive during the Christmas holidays. I'm a 25-year-old female, and my family and I booked a few dives. All of them are really good scuba divers, better than me. They passed a few scuba diving levels that allow them to participate in way more technical dives. I enjoy scuba diving as well, and I'm able to do almost every casual dive but I do not feel safe diving without the aid of an instructor yet, even more if it's a dive with decompression stops required. If anyone isn't familiar with scuba diving, here's a quick explanation. You can dive safely until a certain depth before the pressure becomes dangerous. If you dive below that point, which is roughly 20 meters or 65 feet, you have to do decompression stops during your ascent. It means that you have to stop while going back to the surface for a time to let your body adapt itself to the pressure. If you ascend too quickly, you may catch decompression sickness or bends, which can lead, in worst case scenario, to death. So, we decided that I could manage a little private lesson with an instructor first, prior to more exciting dives with my family. So, the first day, my family was enjoying a dive on a technical spot that I wasn't feeling up to while I was alone with my instructor and retrieving my old scuba diving reflexes. Everything went okay. We were on a beautiful coral reef. There were many beginners on the boat and I was by far the more experienced here. So finally, my instructor decided that he could manage me with another student. Truly a beginner. And after a small briefing with all safety rules and hand signals, we began our descent. I quickly retrieved all my old reflexes and was enjoying myself, going back and forth from the instructor and the beginner diver over at least 20 minutes. Everything was perfect besides one thing. It was a windy day and there was a heavy swell. It's less of a problem underwater than it is for surface swimmers. The only thing was that it requires more physical effort to swim, so my air bottle was emptying a little quicker than usual, which is normal. I signed to my instructor that I was running thin of air, and he nodded. It was far from being critical. It was at this moment that I saw a young man swimming towards me. It wasn't the instructor, nor the student. I hadn't seen him before, but he was in full scuba diving gear, and we were the only dive boat on the spot, so I assumed he was with us, and I just hadn't paid attention to him on the boat. He was swimming fast towards me, and then signaled to me that he was out of air. When an air failure happens in scuba diving, there is a very strict procedure. You have to help the person, no questions asked, because every second is vital. If you faint underwater, you drown. On your gear, you have two breathing devices, a main device and a spare device. So I handed the guy my spare breathing device, which meant that we were both breathing on my gear, consuming twice as much air as I was consuming alone. I waited till the guy seemed to calm down and tried to hand sign him to go see my instructor. He shook his head no and signaled me to start our ascent. I understood this is the procedure 
and above the decompression stop level, so the right thing to do was go up to the surface before having an air failure. But I'd have to tell my instructor first. The guy was very reluctant, and it was strange because it would have taken us 30 seconds to tell the instructor, and he would have started an ascent with us. During this time, I was panicking as seeing my own air level go down, and I saw that our instructor was staring at us quizzically and swimming towards us. It was at this moment that the guy let go of my spare air device and started swimming away, breathing again on his own breathing device. I was totally lost and started my ascent with my instructor. Once at the surface, because of the tides, I was feeling dizzy and nauseous, so my bizarre encounter wasn't the first thing that I debriefed. It was after I calmed down and the boat was driving us towards the beach that I asked my instructor about what happened. Oh, I don't know. Maybe a guy who lost his group and needed some time to calm down. I reply, okay, but why did he tell me that he was out of air? My instructor told me that I probably misunderstood his hand signal, that he was probably not telling me that he was having air failure, because he left breathing on his own device. I'm sure I saw him do the air failure sign, but okay. The next day, I joined my family during my dive, and the instructor was different. I had time to think about the guy, and I was worried about him. So I told her everything that happened to Charlie, and asked her if she knew the guy, and if he was okay because I didn't see him going back to the surface. She asked me to describe him, which I did. And she told me, Oh, that's Marvin. No, don't worry about him. He's preparing himself to be a scuba diving instructor. Every time he has a day off from the restaurant he's working in, he asks us to drive him on the coral reef in the morning and to pick him up in the afternoon. I ate at his restaurant this afternoon and saw him. Don't worry. I was feeling relieved and just told myself it was a comprehension issue with Marvin. The rest of the week went without any incident. I was doing more and more technical dives, and everything went very smoothly. Charlie was a wonderful instructor. I never saw Marvin again. This was until the last dive. It was on New Year's Eve. We planned the best dive on that day. It was on a shipwreck, and I felt trained enough to try it without any instructor just my family and I. It was fairly deep for a beginner like me, 30 meters at its down point, around 98 feet. My first day male instructor was there and told us that he would be exploring the shipwreck too, so we would cross him and he would help me if he saw that I needed it. It was very comforting to know and my family felt comforted too when I told them that. So we began our descent and started swimming around the shipwreck. We crossed our old instructor twice, but every time, I signed him that everything was okay. It was at that moment that I saw Marvin swimming towards me. It was about 5 to 10 meters above my down point. I was a little surprised and even more surprised when he signaled me again that he was out of air. I was mistrustful, but if there was any chance that this would be true, I couldn't not help him. So I handed him my spare breather. He took it started breathing on it, and took my arm. I reached to see the air level instruments, but he prevented me from seeing it. Then, he signed me to start ascent with them. I immediately signed no. I wasn't at my deepest when he reached me, but I have been deeper during this time, and I had a decompression stop to do. I saw that my father saw us, but he quickly looked away, probably not understanding what was going on. I tapped on my diving computer, a device which calculates when and how long to decompress, to signify it to him. He shrugged, smiled at me, and started swimming upwards, still holding me. I was paralyzed for a few seconds, and the thing that helped me react was that my diving computer was telling me to stop and decompress now. I then understood that I was in danger, that if I let him do what he wanted, I would die from the bends. I then started screaming, only to remember that no noise can be heard underwater. I started wriggling frantically as I saw my father and sisters way below me, my diving computer alerting me more and more intensely. At that moment, my father saw us, and he reacted. He swam very quickly towards us, and I managed to hit the guy as my dad gripped my ankle and suddenly dragged me deeper. 
The guy then quickly swam away. My dad dragged me deeper again and then waited for the very long decompression stop to ensure that I would be okay. We then started heading very slowly and cautiously to the surface. On the surface, I started crying frantically and went back to the boat. My father then told me that he thought Marvin was my old instructor and this is why he wasn't surprised at first. I then told my instructor who took it more seriously this time and told me to show him Marvin when he came up to the surface. Thing is, he never did. The next day on New Year's, we went one last time to the scuba diving club because my little sister had a diploma to collect and we saw Charlie. Still shocked. I told her what happened with Marvin, and then she told me that Marvin was at the restaurant yesterday for New Year's Eve, and he didn't go scuba diving, which means that this guy wasn't Marvin, and to this day, I still don't know who he was and what he wanted, and why he tried to kill me, maybe twice. There are some really, really messed up reasons to live in a haunted house. I, being of sound mind and body, don't know any of them. But I am superstitious as hell. So when the wife and I moved up to New Hampshire, right on the Vermont border, we were looking for a place to rent for a year or two before we bought a house. Now, for all the New Englanders here, my wife is a native. I'm not. She's used to New England and the vast emptiness this small area has. There are places even she won't let me travel to after a certain hour, because that route you have to take, people don't come back from. Of course, I'm not a native, so I don't know this. So when I would come home late after dark from work and tell her I took X route, she would kind of look in shock and awe at my stupidity. We found a home right above the mentioned border on the Vermont side. We loved it. It was a fantastic place to live. Except the basement. I could not shake the feeling of being watched and stalked like prey. So, like any reasonable adult, I just said fuck it and didn't go down there, except during the day. So, one night, after gaming for hours in my loft, I got hungry. I went downstairs, kissed the missus, and walked past my basement door towards my kitchen. I don't know if anyone reading this has gone hunting, but there is a moment you sometimes experience, especially hunting predators like coyote, wolves, bears. Sometimes they know you have them in your sight. Sometimes they look towards you, not quite at you, but it feels like they are boring into your soul, saying, you got me. Make it quick. It's an eerie feeling, and sometimes you take the shot. Sometimes you don't. On that night, as I was walking past the door downstairs, I saw red eyes and a humanoid figure, and I froze. I stopped dead in my tracks. I gave the same look of, you got me, make it quick. After that momentary lapse of sanity, I just scooted away real quick from the door, grabbed a weapon, and called my wife, saying someone was downstairs. Call the police. There is no other entrance to the basement, and I had the door covered with my weapon from a safe position, where I could easily run from the house. The cops show up, I disarm, they clear the house, and they find no person, but they found a set of muddy footprints that start facing the stairs up and then proceed to walk into a wall in the back corner of my basement by the water heater. For some context, the wall in question also blocked off the area directly under my bedroom. It was a solid wall with a small crawl space and about maybe four inches of clearance on the other side of it. Cops call detectives, detectives check it, can't see anyone in it and they can't enter it. Photographs are taken, shoe size is compared. We get a contact number for the detective. My wife and I stay at a hotel for a couple of nights. 
For months afterwards, I would have the same thing happen. Eventually, minus the cops, it actually got relatively normal. Good old red eyes in the basement, chilling like a villain. My wife was less enthused by my antics, cheerfully just going about, and when I would spot red eyes, I would always give him a cheery, good day, how are you doing? Of which, we would still have muddy footprints, and I would just clean them up. So, COVID hits, lockdowns happen, and we have an opportunity to move to a better house, one where we would be able to work at home better. The main reason the home was better was that we had a mold issue in this house. It was in between the panes of glass and the windows. Every day we were cleaning it up from the windowsills, door frames. Hell, we had to replace pieces of furniture multiple times, and we are very clean people. We notified the landlord over multiple months, and eventually a year, and after their actions not helping at all, we decided to move. The landlord decided to get a housing inspector out there immediately after we left. The inspector comes and verifies there is a mold issue. I don't know if they met red eyes. However, they did find a metric ton of readings of high spore counts on the wall bordering the space below my old bedroom the wall where the footprints always ended. So, since it was filled, the inspector scoops a bit of the earth on the other side of the wall through that crawl space. It wasn't earth as in dirt, it was approximately seven feet of mold. The landlord immediately contacted specialists to remove all of it and notified me to offer some kind of damages for it in the form of refunded partial rent payments. All in all, it made my 2020 pretty good until about three months later. The landlord calls me and offers to send me a full refund of all the rent from the time I was living there, minus what she gave me. Why? There was a corpse. The medical examiner said it was the man who owned the property before my landlord. He was a lineman who, after talking to the surviving family members, wore a size 8 shoe, smaller than my size 11 shoes, bigger than my wife's shoes by a mile, Red Eyes, I don't know how you got there, but Hellbud, I hope you now found peace. Sorry for not checking it out sooner. I did, after reading about his obituary and contacting his family, swing by his final resting place to drop off flowers and place a stone. And I shared a good morning like I used to. Till better times, Red Eyes. Years ago, man, I am old, but let's say the mid-1990s, I worked as a woodland firefighter while in the army reserves. I worked as a spotter. Basically, I was stationed in a giant fire tower in the middle of a national park. My job was just as it sounds. I would use binoculars and look out for fire, smoke, and other telltale signs of fire. My nearest compadre was five miles or so from me. My days consisted of working my shift, taking long walks around the fire tower, being on the lookout for anyone who might have illegal fires, looking out for wildlife, and staying afoot of bears and wolves. The way our shifts worked back then was one week on, one week off. So we slept in towers, cooked our food, etc. There were nearby toilets and showers. One day, I came across an illegal bear trap. I had several ranger friends and I safely set off the trap, then picked it up to take it to the ranger station on one of my treks out for food in my jeep. Poaching is illegal in the park, and carried a big fine even back then, and some jail time, but it did not stop the poachers from trying. I heard rifle shots and headed back to my fire tower. We did have a rifle in the tower, to be used in case of emergencies. Just a few months back, a fellow spotter had been mauled to death by a grizzly, so each tower had been outfitted with a rifle. I looked with my binoculars, but I didn't see anything out of the ordinary. I radioed my co-worker, Ben, an older guy in the adjacent tower. He hadn't heard anything today, but came across a few traps himself. That night, after dinner of frankenbeans and toast, 
I was writing to my future wife when I heard the rumbling of a truck, thinking it may be Ben. Occasionally he made the trek over. We would crack open a soda and chew fat for a bit. Instead, I saw four men with rifles get out of the truck. One looked around and leaned up against my truck, while the other three grabbed traps and began to set them up. I grabbed the rifle and my lantern and headed down the stairs. I was only 21, a farmer's son from a rural Virginian farming town, and even with one deployment behind me, I was naive. I should have called it in to the rangers, but instead, I thought I could talk some sense into four dangerous men. I barely got a, hey, what are you doing, out of my mouth, before I was roughly shoved by rough hands. My lantern fell, and I heard it crack. The rifle was kicked away from me, and I felt the breath leave my chest when I was violently kicked in the stomach. I barely had caught my breath when I was grabbed by two of the men. I was shoved forward into the woods. It seemed like we walked for miles, but in reality, it was probably only one mile. However, I noticed there were no sounds. In the forest, it is rarely silent. It's a cacophony of sounds, even at night. Owls, the wolves, crickets. But on this night, nothing. Suddenly, I was shoved onto my knees and I felt hot tears well up. I thought of my parents, my little sister and brother, and my fiancé who were back at home in Virginia. I heard the rack of a gun and I shut my eyes and prayed. Suddenly, the night erupted. However, it was the sounds of sirens, those of the forest rangers, and behind them in his pickup, Ben, who had tried to radio me that there had been car engines, and came to my tower when I didn't reply. The poachers were arrested. Ben drove me back to the tower. I was still shaking. He didn't lay into me for not following procedure. He just said, that was close, kid. I ended up leaving the job months later to take a closer job to home, but I never ran into any more poachers during the rest of my time. I kept in contact with Ben for a while, sending him a wedding invite, and then a photo of my firstborn son in 1997. However, as time usually does, we lost track of one another, and a few years back I googled him. He would have been 75 or so. I discovered he passed away a few years back. I don't know whatever came of those poachers, but I know I never want to meet them again. My husband and I lived in a tiny 1950s bungalow in a cute little town, the type of place where Main Street is gentrified, with tiny restaurants and art galleries, but surrounded by lower working class homes. The area was pretty shady, but we bought it in 2005 for what we thought was an absolute steal, in hopes the area itself would turn around. We knew and liked all of our immediate neighbors, but just a street over in any direction were pretty rough areas. Anyway, we'd lived there for nearly five years and felt pretty safe, even with a few iffy incidents. One night around nine, my husband went to the gym with one of his friends, and I went to the kitchen to make some popcorn before I settled in to watch TV. Through the curtain of the kitchen window, I saw a car's headlights slow to a stop. I didn't think too much of it, as our street was pretty heavily trafficked. A few moments later, I heard my dog start barking and a loud knock at the door. Thinking it was a neighbor, I went to the door and pulled back the blinds. I saw a man with a bandana covering his face, pointing a gun at me and screaming. I'm not sure if it was another language, or if I was just too stunned to understand what he was saying, but I turned and ran with my dogs towards the back of the house, as three gunshots fired behind me. My dogs and I ran into the backyard, and I plastered myself against the house, on the other side of the fence, I see the car from before still sitting there. I jumped as two more gunshots fired into the backyard, then I heard a car door slam and watched as the car peeled off. My neighbors were all too scared to come out at first, but after I called out to them for a while, they came out and helped me over the fence. 
and I called the cops and got in touch with my husband at the gym. The police came and collected evidence and said there were footprints on my door. As if after he shot, the assailant tried to kick my door in. They asked me flat out who would want to kill me, and the answer is no one. My husband and I have never had enemies of any sort, and the only thing they could figure out was it was either some sort of gang initiation or a case of the wrong location. Why they would shoot at a girl in her pajamas, I have no idea. One of the bullets lodged into the door jamb of my living room, right at my head level. If it had been a few inches to the right, it would have hit me. Another bullet ricocheted into the dining room, which was the next room I ran through. We packed up that night and went to my parents' house, and I never spent another night there again. We found another place to live about six months later, but we are stuck with this house that's now worth about half what we paid for, and the area is still pretty shitty. Nothing ever came of my investigation. It's a big county with a lot of crime, and they have bigger fish to fry. But there was a large drug bust a couple of blocks away shortly thereafter, and 13 people were arrested. I can only speculate that it could be related. I dealt with some pretty rough PTSD for about a year after, but I live in a much safer place now, and I'm just happy to be alive. This happened in the late 2000s when I was 12 years old. I grew up and live in a developing nation. I was never given permission by my parents to stay out after 7pm for any reason, regardless of the requirement. A movie that ends at 6.30pm and I was dropped home by my friend's parents. No. Study at my neighbor's house past 7pm. No. So I was naturally very excited when I got permission to go watch a late night movie with all my cousins and stay the night at my grandmother's place. There were six of us together, five male and one female. I was the youngest, the rest were all adults, mid-twenties. The movie finishes at 2am and we were asked to go straight from the movie theater to home, which was nearby. I was more excited to see the city late at night, more than watching the new movie that was a big hit. We all went in three motorcycles to the theater and decided that once the movie was over, we would go to a cafe that was open 24-7 to have some ice cream in there. This was the only place that was still open and was relatively far away from my grandparents' house. I can't tell you how excited all of us were because this was a new place that opened up in my city and was very popular. My friends used to brag about how many times they've gone to the place and how beautiful the view of the city lake is in the middle of the night. Once the movie was over and we come outside, except for the crowd from the theater, the roads were completely deserted, not a soul in sight. Only the streetlights lit up the roads filled with potholes and nothing. Not even the medical stores were open. My female cousin had extremely strict parents, so she declined to come and said she has to be home because her parents were waiting up for her to get back. We all tried to convince her to come with us, there are six of us after all, but to no end. She was adamant that she had to be home, and we eventually decided to let her go. There were now four of us, two on each motorcycle. We started riding towards the cafe. I was the pillion, with my brother riding, and I noticed that one motorcycle was following us. I told my brother immediately, and he said they're probably going to the same place and to ignore it. A little further, another motorcycle asked my cousin to stop and pretended to ask for directions. They stopped, thinking these guys were lost and started giving them directions. While we were talking to the guys asking for directions, two more motorcycles show up and surround us. And now there's somehow eight people surrounding us. At this point, we realized that this was an ambush, but it was already too late. One of the guys pushed my cousin from the motorcycle onto the ground and started hitting him. The rest of us were trying to defend him. Once the fighting stops, they all start to ask us to call our female cousin and tell her to come back. They have been following us from the theater. They said, tell her you need to talk to her. Ask her to come back. He needs to see her. 
At first, we pretend we had no women with us. We don't know what he's talking about. He told us he'll kill us all if we don't ask her to come meet us. The roads were abandoned, and the occasional car that goes on the road just passed by without slowing down. Most likely, the people in the car were afraid of getting involved. The guys were clearly having fun, laughing while they punched and kicked us. With no help in sight, one of my cousins punches one of the guys and yells, Run. And instinctively, we all run in different directions, abandoning our motorcycles on the street. They start chasing us on foot at first. Then they went back, got on their motorcycles, and started chasing us through the streets. I didn't have a phone with me, and I was unfamiliar with the area. I ran randomly, looking for a place to hide. I jumped a wall into a random person's house while the motorcycles drove by on the road, looking for us. I don't know where the rest of my cousins were. The house I jumped into was home to a huge dog who started barking at me, waking up the owners. They obviously assumed I was there to rob them, but having one look at a 12-year-old boy in tears and clearly shaken, they asked me what happened. I explained everything and told them I had no idea where my brothers were. They gave me a phone and I called the police, who said they would dispatch a patrol car and we can expect it in two hours. I had all my brothers' numbers memorized, but I didn't want to call them as I was afraid they might be hiding and calling their cell phone might give them away. I thanked the kind people who offered to host me until the morning, but I had to get to my grandmother's place to find out if my cousins made it back. I snuck through the streets and found my grandparents' house. Two of my cousins made it back, but my brother was still out there. Finally, he calls us and tells us that he's in hiding and will come back once the sun comes out and when there's a general crowd outside. Until dawn, the motorcycles kept passing by our house, and we were afraid one of them followed us home. At dawn, my brother gets back. I was the only one uninjured. One of my cousins got stitches on his face, another one broke his ribs, and my brother had a hairline fracture. We all ran through the night, and suddenly, all the strict imposition by our parents made sense to us. My brother called the cops too, and no one showed up. There was no support from anyone, and I can't even imagine what would have happened if my female cousin was with us. We never got a call back from the cops to ask if we were fine. I can't even begin to imagine what would have happened if they caught one of us. Needless to say, we never went out anywhere late at night for a long time. Back in the late fall to winter of 2005, I went to Phoenix with my family. I was in high school and my sister was in college. At the time, there were no Sonics on the East Coast, but we'd seen commercials for them. So my dad looks up to see if there's one where we're staying, and there is. So naturally, we decided to go. We didn't rent a car, so we ended up walking to Sonic and back. It was late at night but we didn't think anything of it. The walk was uneventful overall. There was one point, though, where this car seemed to drive by us really slowly, and we got the feeling that they were looking at us. Whatever. It was a busy road, and there didn't seem to be many people walking. It was late, and we were kind of distinct looking. We got back, and found out that there were two killers on the loose around that time. The serial shooter and the baseline killer. My dad looked it up, and one or both of them had been active in that area we were staying, and had actually been right near the Sonic. He joked that if he'd known, we wouldn't have gone. Months later, when they were caught, they had pictures in the paper. I don't remember what the guy looked like who was scoping us out in his car, but according to one of my family members, it totally was this killer. The even weirder part is that someone was actually killed by this guy, not long after we were walking back from the Sonic, so the timeline actually matches up pretty closely. It gives me the willies to think that there's a distinct possibility that a serial killer scoped out my family.
This happened way back in October of 2006. At the time, I was just a 19-year-old kid, always on the lookout for adventure. One Friday night, after wrapping up my shift at McDonald's, I met up with some friends who suggested we check out this haunted location called White's Bridge. My one buddy Brandon said he had recently learned about it and then began telling us the legends associated with the hundred-year-old wood-covered bridge. Never one to turn down a spooky experience, we all piled into my green Ford Taurus and headed out onto our journey. Brandon gave directions, guiding me off the main road and within ten minutes, we were on the dirt back roads, surrounded by woods and cornfields. Our only point of reference was the blinking cell tower off in the distance. We could tell we were getting further from the city as our cell phones slowly began losing service. As we rode deeper and deeper into what legitimately felt like the absolute middle of nowhere, Brandon repeated the legend associated with the bridge. Back in the early 1900s, a local farmer discovered that his beloved wife had been cheating on him, and in a fit of rage, he killed her and her lover after discovering them in the act. After committing the cold-blooded murder, the farmer left his home and wandered the dirt roads in a daze. He eventually came upon White's Bridge, where the realization of what he had done finally began to sink in, and deciding he would rather die than face the consequences of his actions, he hoisted a rope up and over one of the bridge's rafters and hung himself. As far as I can tell now, this story is complete fiction but we totally believed it at the time. After a long and bumpy ride, Brandon instructed me to turn right on an off-road that I wouldn't have even noticed had he not pointed it out. I took the turn, and there before us was White's Bridge. It looked like something straight out of a horror film, an old wood-covered bridge, aged by time, sitting alone above a river in the middle of nowhere. We parked the car on the side of the road and got out to explore. Immediately catching our eyes was a scarecrow, lying abandoned at the entrance to the bridge. My friend Mike, who was known as somewhat of a risk taker, and a stupid one at that, picked up the scarecrow and lit it on fire. The hay body burst up into a ball of flames, and Mike waved it around proudly next to the old dry wood bridge. Realizing the risk, I told him to throw the damn thing in the river and put it out, which thankfully he did. After making sure there weren't any rogue embers that could ignite the bridge, Brandon suggested we get back in the car and pull it onto the bridge. He explained that the legend was that if you parked your car in the middle of the bridge, put it into neutral and killed the engine, the spirit of the dread farmer would push the vehicle forward to get it off the bridge. Naturally, we had to try this. We piled back in and did exactly as he said. We parked halfway across the rickety old bridge and killed the engine. We sat in the pitch black, saying nothing, waiting for something, anything to happen. The only sounds were the creaking of the bridge, the flowing river beneath us, and footsteps. Suddenly the back driver's side door opens and a woman abruptly enters the back seat, cramming in next to my two friends back there. She looked to be in her late twenties or early thirties, long straight black hair, slim, and just like the scarecrow, wearing a plaid shirt and blue jeans. It's been a while, but this is essentially how I remember the conversation going. I saw your fire signal for me, she said. Uh, wait, what? I replied totally freaked out and at a complete loss for words. I'm so glad you came. My boyfriend's car broke down that way. I need a ride back. My brain was doing its best to compute the situation. I'm sorry, but who are you? I asked. What are you doing out here? I told you, she responded curtly. My boyfriend's car broke down over there. Can you please just give me a ride so I don't have to walk all the way back? She was pointing ahead towards a narrow road that forked off to the right on the other side of the bridge. My friend Mike, the scarecrow burner, and ever the gentleman added, I mean, if you need a place to stay, you're more than welcome to come crash at my place. I got plenty of drink and 
I interrupted him. No, lady. Listen. I'm sorry. I don't know who you are. You just got into my car, and this is all really weird. You could be an ex-murderer for all I know, and I'm sorry. You have to get out. She glared at me in the rearview mirror. If looks could kill, I would have been done for. But you signaled for me, she responded in an irritated tone. We weren't signaling for you. Get out. She let out an angry sigh and got out, walking back in the direction from which she came, and disappeared into the night. I started the engine right up and looked at my friends. They all had looks of disbelief on their face. Without saying a word, I put the car in drive and slowly rolled forward and off the bridge. We needed to turn around and go back across the bridge to get back where we'd come from, and the only way to do that was pull onto the side road that the woman said her boyfriend's car had broken down on, and then reverse. As I pulled down onto the side road, my headlights illuminated three poster signs that I hadn't been able to see from the bridge. No trespassing, private property, and do not enter. Looking up the road, there was no sign of the woman. Wherever she went, it didn't appear she went that way. I didn't want to stick around though, so I backed up and crossed the bridge again. And from there, began the journey home. We didn't have much to say on the ride home. I think we were all equally stunned. Except for mine, who asked if we knew anyone that would be awake at this hour, so that he could score some weed. I visited White's Bridge a couple of times after that but nothing of note happened in my subsequent visits. Sadly, some delinquents burned down the old White's Bridge some years ago. It was rebuilt, but from what I hear, it's just not the same as the original. I don't have any plans to go and check it out.